A warm welcome to all of you. Welcome to the panel discussion on management of melasma and hyperpigmentation, India and global perspective. Today's webinar is organized by Aesthetic Medicine India and powered by IPCA. In dermatology, IPCA has embarked upon a leadership position in trichology and with its innovative differential product offerings has been extending unique solutions for management of acne and melasma. I am Shriyal Setu Madhuvan, the executive editor of Aesthetic Medicine India. And on behalf of the Aesthetic Medicine India team, I would like to thank our partner, all our panelists for this evening and our attendees for joining us today. Aesthetic Medicine is the original business to business magazine for the discerning aesthetic professionals. Founded in the UK 18 years ago, the India edition is founded and led by the professional beauty group. I would say it's a must read for medical practitioners such as dermatologists, clinic managers, aesthetic doctors, plastic surgeons, and selected aestheticians and cosmetologists. We also did introduce the Aesthetic Medicine Conference and Expo in India in 2019 with the aim to connect the medical fraternity with the supply, stay, say, uh, supply chain stakeholders and provide a platform for networking, sourcing, and training. Then came 2020 and since the world was besieged with the pandemic. We at Aesthetic Medicine continued working hard to keep the fraternity engaged. We took on the challenge and set ourselves on an exciting digital journey. In all success, Aesthetic Medicine digital series were introduced and our webinars and online interactions with experts have been instrumental in bringing vital information to practitioners on various aspects of dealing with the current situation. So our today's webinar, our today's online virtual event will focus on management of melasma and hyperpigmentation and India and global perspective. Interestingly, we're going to be having a series of sessions and discussions lined up for today. I'll give you a quick glimpse so that you know what exactly and why do you need to stay back from now till we end our evening at 8.30 p.m. Our first session will focus on an international perspective on pigmentation in the eye area. This will be followed by a theoretic discussion on melasma management. Further, we will also have an international perspective on PRP for melasma, followed by another global session on procedural options in melasma management. And our fifth and concluding session for today will be a panel discussion that focuses on procedural options in melasma management and Indian perspective. So do stay tuned for all our sessions starting now. At the bottom of our screen, this is specially for all my attendees, at the bottom of your screen, you would see a Q&A box and the chat box. The chat box is where I am going to be interacting with you, but the Q&A box is where you are going to be interacting with the speakers. So for any questions that you may have, I request you to put it into the Q&A box and we would try our best to have them addressed during the session or post our event today. Introducing our first session for today, an international perspective on pigmentation in the eye area. And I would like to invite our eminent speaker from the UK to join us. Dr. Uche Aniagwu, founder of Dr. Uche Teotroff Academy. Thank you so much for that, Shriyal. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, thank yes. you very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure, but I would like to introduce you to my attendees with a few more words. So please allow me cool. that, Dr. Uche. Uh, considered one of the leading experts in tear trough fillers, Dr. Uche has established himself in London as a key contributor to the community through education and also as a practitioner, formerly with Beyond Medispa Havli Nichols. As the author of the Essential Eye Beauty Guide, he has been an expert contributor to the likes of Aesthetic Medicine Magazine and several others. And in his clinical presentation on hyperpigmentation, Dr. Uche will focus on accessible injectable treatment options, along with sharing an overview on the key topical ingredients. Uh, I now request Dr. Uche to take the session forward. You would have 15 minutes for this session and over to you from here. Thank you so much for that, Shriya. And, and hopefully this time I can actually talk now about interrupting you. <laughs> Guys, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. It's a real pleasure. I've got 15 minutes to keep your attention and hopefully teach you something. And I'm hoping that I can do both of those, but at the very least, I'll do one of those. All right, cool. So let's start by having a look at the presentation screen. Let's move forward. Okay, any one moment. Okay, good. I'm guessing you can all see the screen now at this point. So this talk is all about, like Shriyal said, 
uh, infraorbital hyperpigmentation, which is sort of where my focus is anyway, infraorbital rejuvenation. So the objectives of this talk are to be able to recognize a presentation, uh, if you like, of infraorbital hyperpigmentation, and then it's sort of explore the etiology of, of hyperpigmentation and describe the most accessible treatment options for hyperpigmentation. I mean, I could talk about this for, for hours, but we're gonna try and keep it condensed into what's accessible to most practitioners. And then we'll have a quick review of some of the clinically proven topical agents. Now there are a whole load of them, but the ones that are really popular that you probably come across and just understand how they work. So before we get started with that, a little bit about me, uh, Sri, I'll told you who I am. So I'm a trainer over here in London or the UK, and uh, I have a, a tier trough training academy which focuses on rejuvenation of the infraorbital region where I teach other practitioners. I've written, I've spoken, I've done blah, blah, blah. And my Instagram is full of content and educational stuff for you guys to look at. It's below uh, if anyone wants to ever take a look. Now, the presentation is important because you want to be able to tell what you're looking at because the infraorbital region is full of issues of pigmentation but i want to be very specific between having discoloration and having hyperpigmentation now you can have hyperpigmentation which is secondary to overproduction of melanin versus pigmentation which could be secondary to vascular permeability and, and hemosiderate we're not looking at that today so we're looking at hyperpigmentation which is melanin overproduction and being able to identify that uh, is, is important because you want to be able to know what you're looking at when you look at your patient's under eyes. Now, in Asian and black skin, it tends to pre uh, present as a bit more diffuse brown darkening of the under eye area, typically going from the medial canthus to the mid three line. It tends to follow the tear trough groove, whereas in Caucasian skin, it, it, it comes a little bit more freckled. So again, it's brown, in, in nature, but a little bit more freckled than the diffuse pattern and, and similarly follows the uh, tear trough brood. Now, one way you can very, if you like, it's a very rudimentary way of distinguishing between types of uh, pigmentation or discoloration under the eye is a simple stretch test. Now, where it's hyperpigmentation, if you do a simple stretch test, which involves you stretching the skin, you get minimal to no change in terms of the presentation of the discoloration. And that's because the melanin is sitting in the dermis or at times the epidermis. And lovely uh, model here is one of my patients from my training academy who you can see has some hyperpigmentation in the medial aspects of her infraorbital region. Now, what are the causes of, of hyperpigmentation? So, you get this process that is known as melanocytosis, which basically involves melanocytes producing a lot more melanin, which is the pigmented color that we get in our skin. Now, for most people, it's actually idiopathic. Basically, I meaning we don't really know, there's no discernible trigger, and it, it tends to be linked uh, to family history more so. So it, it's more of an inherited component. But in others, it, it can be post-inflammatory. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of PIH, which is you know, post-inflammatory uh, hyperpigmentation, which is ultimately secondary to any one of the uh, factors that I've listed here. So potentially something as simple as uh, atopy. So hay fever, for example, rubbing and scratching of eyes, itchy eyes, something like that can lead to inflammation, which leads to darkening under the eyes. Or it can be UV exposure, because a lot of people think that, you know, sunlight beats your forehead, your cheeks, and nowhere else. Nope, it hits your eyelids, your eyes too. Um, so that can also cause hyperpigmentation. And then drugs as well. So prostaglandins, uh, if people are using those for things such as conditions like glaucoma, uh, they can cause hyperpigmentation. As can eye drops um, used for eyelash lengthening, like lattice, which isn't used here in the UK, but is used in America. I'm not sure exactly what it's like in India, if you guys have Latisse or not, but eyelash stimulators, which can also cause hyperpigmentation of the eyes. So these are, these are post-inflammatory or secondary to something else, whereas most people it's idiopathic. Now, I wanted to talk to you guys about the accessible treatment options. So what exactly do I mean by accessible? It's the kind of stuff that we could all access if we started a practice tomorrow. 
So I'm, I'm not really going much into chemical peels at the middle deep level or lasers, which have all had sort of shown efficacy for treating uh, hyperpigmentation uh, under the eyes. But I'm looking more at the injectable and topical side of things, things that you could use tomorrow if you set up the clinic. So if you're looking at things that you can use under your eyes, you've got to think about how is it going to have an effect? What, what is it doing? And the simple answer is, if your problem is an overproduction of melanin, then you need to target that melanin production cycle somewhere along the line, be that through enzyme inhibition, competitively or non-competitively, be that whatever aspects you like, you've got to be able to target somewhere along that production line. So the most common treatments for higher pigmentation, at least that we use here in the UK or my clinic anyway, are topical treatments uh, and mesotherapy injectable treatments, of which one of them is an example here uh, called light eyes. But for the most part, topical creams and serums tend to be really helpful because people can use them at home. They don't need to come in all the time and they're a lot more inexpensive than using a mesotherapy, which requires you normally to come in a few times, three to four times over a 10, 12 week period and can be quite expensive, but both can be pretty effective. Now, I just spoke about, you know, if you're gonna target the process, what exactly, you know, where along the chain are you fitting in to break up that melanin production? And what I've listed here are a few of the most common ingredients uh, that you find in the battle against hyperpigmentation and how they work. So one of them is arbutin and arbutin is really stepped to the forefront in the last sort of half a decade. Um, as we've seen companies like Abaji uh, who can no longer use um, hydroquinone uh, here in the UK. And I think it's the same over for you guys in India. Um, as that's transitioned out and phased out, arbutin has really come in. And arbutin comes from a bearberry plant. At least it's one of the places you can extract it from and typically works in concentrations of two to 7% uh, to be effective. Um, now it's, it works well. It's been shown to have a really good effect under the, under the eyes for pigmentation. But like a lot of these ingredients, it tends to work well in combination. So targeting the pathway at different points is important. And this is a tyrosinase inhibitor, which basically means that it blocks the enzyme that makes a crucial component of melanin. Um, now, one of the concerns around arbutin are the concerns around rebound hyperpigmentation, basically meaning that when you stop using it, sometimes you can get what we call paradoxical pig uh, pigmentation. So you actually got worse darken in the eyes than you had beforehand, or the same level, but it's like it lightens, you stop, and then it comes back worse. So there can be issues with that, not too dissimilar to the issues that were seen with hydroquinone. Another ingredient uh, that's very common, that's risen to, again, a lot of popularity, is kojic acid, which also um, inhibits tyrosine synthesis, um, which is, of course, again, like you guys know by now, is important in stopping um, is stopping for melanin production, uh, but it's also pretty good because it, 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 it works pretty well. Again, better with other products, but you know, it is effective and it, it's not very toxic. It has still got some slight toxicity. It's not quite as, as uh, harmless as let's say your vitamin Cs, which do have a little bit of a, 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 a high pigmentation lightening effect, but not as effective. Uh, but kojic acid works pretty well. It's not overly toxic. It does give you temporary lightening and there are fewer issues uh, around rebound hyperpigmentation than you have with, let's say, arbutin. And then one that everyone knows really well is your trechinoans. Um, it's a retinoid uh, and all the different types of retinoids for that matter are really helpful um, because not only do they work to improve uh, or to inhibit melanocytosis, so that's the production of melanin, they also help with collagen synthesis which is really helpful because oftentimes a lot of eye or under eye issues tend to come in conjunction. So it's not unusual to see hyperpigmentation with skin laxity or, or worsened skin quality, or even um, some puffiness or other types of discoloration around the eyes. So the bluey tint, which can be sometimes because the skin is thin and you start to have a bit of transparency. So by working on collagen synthesis, it thickens the skin and can help to solve some of those other problems like laxity or even the discoloration that comes from seeing the underlying vasculature or orbicularis oculi muscle. 
Um, so that's another very effective method of treatment. Now, what won't work uh, are hyaluronic acid fillers. They are great for solving problems with shadows. They're great for adding volume, but they don't decrease pigmentation, nor does uh, platelet-rich platelet plasma, so PRP, and nor does radio frequency. That's great for skin tightening. You know, if you want to go a bit more advanced, you want to really be looking at potentially lasers and, and peels. And typically your timeframes will tend to work for these topical treatments as soon as two weeks, but tend to reach full effects by about 12 weeks. And there are always these step down procedures, depending on what you use, that allow people to have a long-term plan that can keep them, if you like, uh, continue, continually suppressing the mending production rather than being toxic. And on the side there, you can see the image of a patient who we use light eyes on um, and has had a reduction in their pigmentation. Right, that's it guys. I'm gonna end the uh, share of the presentation there. And I, I guess I'll take any questions if I have any time left. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Uche. That was a very interesting and a very articulate presentation that you put for us. Thank you so much. I'll just check if uh, there is a que any question in the Q&A box. So I think we have one question on PRP, which uh, one of our speakers, Dr. Teresita, is responding to it because uh, mm -hmm. she's also be giving a session on that. Uh, there's another question interested to know why hydroquinone has been banned in the UK. In the UK. So... Hydroquinone was banned because there, was, there were links to it being carcinogenic. Um, now, the studies that showed it was carcinogenic were actually based on the oral ingestion of, of hydroquinone rather than a topical application. So it's a little bit, eh, which is why it's still being used in America, but it, it's the link to car it being a carcinogen as to why it was banned. Uh, another question, what do you think about carboxy therapy? So carboxy therapy can work as well. Um, it's something that I do a lot less of myself in my clinic, but it can be effective. Um, there, are, there, are, there are a whole host of things that tend to work well in unison and together. So what I actually find is that the real answer is if you're treating under eye concerns, you're normally using multiple methodologies and bring them together. So what you're doing in clinic plus what you're doing, the patient's doing at home. Okay, so yeah, I can see some other questions also coming in, but what I'll, uh, the reason I'm not taking them is because we are going to cover them in our sessions to come. So uh, with that, Dr. Uche, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It's a pleasure yeah. having uh, you here with us. And uh, it would be nice if you could, uh, you know, uh, stay back at the back end and watch our sessions that are to follow. Yes, yes but uh, with that, I would move on to our second session for today. Uh, the second session for today is a theoretic panel discussion on platter of cocktails in melasma management, making a genius choice. And this is more of an Indian perspective because we have a panel with experienced dermatologists from India. I would now like to welcome the session moderator and panelists with a brief introduction. Please welcome our session moderator, Dr. Asim Sharma, Chief Dermatologist, Kinsaga Center for Dermatology, Mumbai. Dr. Asim Sharma is the Chief Dermatologist at uh, the Skin Saga Center. He is an invited speaker at many national and international conferences, a published author and honorary secretary of IADVL Maharashtra. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Asim. Introducing and welcoming our uh, panelists who will be joining Dr. Asim for this discussion. Uh, please welcome Dr. Abhishek De, Senior Consultant, Wisdom, Skin and Hair Clinic, Kolkata and Associate Professor, Calcutta National Medical College. Dr. Abhishek De is the member of Specific Group Lasers and the Associate Editor of Indian Journal of Dermatology and Journal of Cutaneous and Aesthetic Surgeon. He is an expert in various laser procedures for scars, pigmentation, tattoo, birthmarks, hair removal, and body shaping. Next, Dr. Malvika Kohli, Dermatology and Aesthetics Director, Skin Secrets India, and Consultant Dermatologist, Just Logan and Breach Candy Hospitals, Mumbai. With over 25 years of experience in the field of aesthetic dermatology, Dr. Malvika Kohli has introduced many new procedures in India. She is an international trainer for injectables and has written chapters on chemical peels, microdermabrasion, and hair cosmetics in the IADVL textbook of dermatology. Next, please welcome Dr. Padmavati Surpaneni, dermatologist and cosmetologist, Pragna Skin and Laser Clinic, Hyderabad. 
With 15 years of experience in clinical and cosmetic dermatology, Dr. Padmavati Surupaneni has been trained in various aesthetic treatments at various centers and under experts in India and abroad. She has also been a faculty and trainer in various national conferences and has conducted training workshops on injectable and body contouring. And last, please welcome Dr. Rashmi Sarkar, Director, Professor, Department of Dermatology, Lady Hardinge Medical College and Associate Hospitals, New Delhi. With 24 years of experience, Dr. Rashmi Sarkar has worked on chemical peels with some of the most cited references on chemical peels in international and national dermatology journals. She has conducted more than 50 workshops on chemical peels across the country and has edited the popular book, Chemical Peels, A Global Perspective. She has also done clinical trials on cosmeceuticals and the sport. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I now request Dr. Asim to take the discussion further. You have 45 minutes for the discussion and uh, we look forward to an engaging one. Over to you, Dr. Asim. Shreel, can you please let me start my video, please? I've been trying for a long yes, time. It's on Dr. Now. Yeah, I had written also in the chat box quite some time back. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, but you have your video on now and over to you, Dr. Asim. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Shreel, for that warm introduction. And I welcome all of you to this lovely Saturday evening. It is raining quite heavily where we are in Mumbai. And I hope the weather is better at your end. So while uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Uche for a wonderful discussion and, you know, a very brief and concise presentation on how to treat the intravital area better and more effectively. But uh, I have been given the daunting task of uh, condensing the thousand plus topicals and orals that we have for melasma and hyperpigmentation into the next 45 minutes. So let's hope we can help you make a genius choice at the end of this presentation. Before I move on, all of us are aware that uh, melasma has a pretty wide prevalent rate, 3.3 uh, to 47%, especially in the skin of color demographic. And the pathomechanisms at play uh, continue to be more and more complex as we do more and more research. Earlier, all the research was centered around melanocytes, but now we know that uh, more often than not, the epidermal melanin unit, which comprises the keratinocytes and dermal components such as fibroblasts and the vascular endothelium have a big role to play when it comes to melasma. Obviously, the triggers are something that we all are aware of, so I'm not going to cover that in the gambit of today's session. In fact, we should be able to classify all the topicals and the orals that we use into four sections. Uh, does the topical or does the agent remove keratinocytes? Does the agent reduce the secretory function of melanocytes via alpha MSH? Does it reduce melanin synthesis by causing tyrosinase inhibition or interfering in any part of the biomelanogenesis pathway? Or does it prevent melanosome transfer from the keratinocytes to the melanocytes? So if we can have a simple classification like this, uh, things would be much more simple for us to discuss in today's panel discussion. Moving on, I'm going to jump right to it because we have a very erudite panel with us. I'm going to start with Dr. Rashmi Sarkar. Uh, Ma'am, when we're choosing the right kind of sunscreen, which is obviously the prima facie for patients with melasma, do we look for a physical or a chemical sunscreen? Do we choose a broad spectrum sunscreen? How important is the extended spectrum where you have visible light and blue light nowadays? And uh, what is your view on tinted sunscreens? Uh, thank you, Asim. I think it's a very pertinent question because we think that we have skin type 4 and 5, dark skin, so we are probably protected by melanin and we don't really need a sunscreen because we don't have so much of skin cancers like abroad, like in the fair skin. But I think that is a bit, all of us really need a sunscreen. I must say that because we also have to protect ourselves from the UVB as well as UVA. UVA has long standing actions on the skin. The photo, you know, uh, damage that occurs on the skin and the photocarcinogenesis that can occur. So please use a sunscreen. When we use a sunscreen, it is good to use a broad-based sunscreen. So ideally, it should be a mix of organic as well as inorganic sunscreens. I don't call it physical, but I call them inorganic ingredients, okay? So titanium dioxide or zinc oxide, wherever you can get iron oxide, nothing like it, because there is also visible, you know, um, rays of the sun which are causing the damage. Regarding blue light, yes, it is coming up, but that I seem is very specific to diseases. Like there is some role in melasma and a couple of other diseases where it is believed that it's more due to, you know, the blue light. Infrared is another thing, but all these have to be documented by evidence. But when we look at a sunscreen, maybe more such ingredients will have to be added, you know, for the entire spectrum. So far, use something which is at least 30 plus SPF, not less, 
30 to 50 will do. Use a broad-based one. Use something which is a combination of organic and inorganic. A tinted one is good. Initially, it may look white, but I have learned from my mentor, Dr. Pantia, that it is actually the tinted one which is giving you protection. The rest of it may be just cosmetic and elegant. Uh, so I think those are great points by you, ma'am. I especially like the point about the tinted ones and the presence of uh, either of the, the uh, metallic oxides, be it titanium, zinc, or if possible, yes. iron, because those actually do provide extended spectrum against visible light, infrared, and like you said, possibly even blue light. Uh, and tinted sunscreens, yes, there are a lot of uh, uh, pharmaceutical brands now which do have much more cosmetic uh, tolerability by patients in terms of, uh, you know, a tint. So I think uh, I, I have my answers here. I'm going to move ahead because we have a uh, paucity of time and many molecules to discuss. But if any panelists would like to jump in at any point, please do let me know. So I'm very happy to say that Dr. Rashmi uh, was one of the first people to lay down the guidelines on what sunscreen to use. He's already mentioned most of these points quite succinctly. So we're going to move ahead. But definitely an SPF of between 30 to 50 PA plus rating is an important thing to cover as well. And something which uh, possibly would cover visible light, infrared, and maybe even uh, blue light as we have more research on it. Uh, Dr. Malvik, I'm going to move to you. Uh, this is my typical forever favorite question. Do you still use a triple combination despite the thousand plus topicals or has it been retired in your practice? Uh, Ma'am, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asim, and it's wonderful to be part of this panel, and thank you, AMI. Um, the, you know, I was never a big fan of the triple combination, and uh, I like the word you've used, retired. Yes, I have retired it from my practice almost. I use it very, very selectively, uh, more in cases of PIH, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and I almost very rarely, if zero, use in melasma. Agreed. Understood, ma'am. Not even on a weekend basis or not even as an initiation, not at all? Actually, as an initiation, I'd like to avoid it because then it becomes an addiction. Correct. Since we're talking about cocktails, we can talk about from initiation to addiction. But also because, um, yes, as part of a maintenance uh, twice a week, you could, uh, but you could also do that with plain hydroquinone uh, without having to use the steroid unless there's a reason for doing so. So, you know, using the triple combination, say if it is resistant to uh, hydroquinone 4% twice a week, then maybe the triple combination twice a week in a very resistant case, maybe, yes, I could, I, I would uh, probably uh, agree to use that. But I find that, you know, uh, with adequate counseling, with the correct sunscreen usage, with good cocktails, which have the other blenders, which are going to come up now with in the next few slides, we can get a very good improvement with the last I think the procedures have helped us a lot also. Okay. Procedures and some of the orals have also helped us to stay off the triple combination. Great. Thank you, ma'am. I, I think so. You're using it as a reserve weapon. That's a, a very heartening thing to note. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, Dr. Padma, any different views? Do you uh, prefer triple combinations in any subset of patients or if you have a routine in which you begin and uh, maybe taper off it, taper it off after some time? Uh, I, uh, I'll say I, I also for me, I will agree with Dr. Malabika that very rarely I am using, I mean, maybe a 20 percent of my total patients, but I find that actually the melasma is a little refractory. See, it's it's has very good amount of evidence is still one of the gold standard of treatment. The problem is Indian patient abuse it. This is a different issue altogether. And we need to be very careful about that because we have seen the menace of uh, steroid abuse in our country. Uh, but whenever I use, I use two or three days in a week. That's the maximum, even from the day one. I mean, if I start, whenever I start triple combination, I never give it daily because once you give it daily, there's a high chance the patient will not like any other drug and will continue with the uh, steroid molecule for that. So if I have to give, I give from two or three days in a weekend basis treatment, that's a max. Correct. So I think I'm happy both of you have said the same thing. Uh, Dr. Padmavati, what about yeah, your practice? I, I agree with the other panelists. I also doesn't do it as a uh, first line nowadays, but when uh, the triple combination come in my practice, when the patient comes uh, with the refractory melasma from other practitioners, or if it is refractive after using the non-hydroquinone products. But first I start with the plain hydroquinone or a double combination without a steroid. <clears throat> and if it is resistant, I use. But as we know, the melasma always relapses. So right. this is a reserve drug like, you know, we can, you know, 
surely say that if I give hydroquinone a triple combination, it will reduce. I reserve it like that, right? How we are reserving etraconazole for our fungal infections nowadays. Understood. Yeah, Asim, I'd like to just yes, please. say here that yes, I do like using you know triple combination, you know, the modified Ligman's regime. Because I do believe that it's good, you know, to get that lightning right from the beginning. So I do use it in my practice, but yes, there's a lot of counseling. And after the fourth or the sixth week, at least, it might become just three times a week. And it's explained in the beginning only that it's going to be rotational therapy because the therapy of melasma is going to be lifelong. So that is it. I believe in hitting hard in the beginning and, of course, with lots and lots of counseling. So I think it's like, you know, the cocktail, Bloody Mary. From teenage to adulthood, which is the drink that one is used to, you know, first of all, it's the bloody medic, you know, which you start off with. So it is old, it is a salty one, but you keep coming back to it, you know, at the end of the day. Yes. <laughs> well said, I think all points well taken. So the panel is divided on this and I think so am I. Uh, I do find usage in a certain subset of patients for sure. But yes, uh, counseling becomes a very, very major part of the whole uh, gambit. So we'll move on to the non-steroid, non-hydroquinone spectrum. We'll open up things a bit now. I am going to start with kojic acid. Uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Padma. Uh, kojic acid, your favorite molecule, your first line, or how do you use the molecule? Yeah, for PIH and all, kojic acid is my uh, first choice, but I prefer giving it at a higher concentration of 4% and 4%. above, okay. rather than a 2%. And a cocktail with the kojic acid, either with the glycolic acid or uh, tetanoin, I would love to uh, give it. Okay. Agreed. Uh, uh, Dr. Abhishek, what about asthma, you? Maybe as a maintenance, because this is a melasma session. Correct. Correct. Of the drugs you have mentioned over there, kojic acid and arbutin are like my favorite drugs. So five uh, days in a week, of course, I'm, I'll be keeping the patient on non-hydroquin and non-steroidal combinations as much as possible. And even for, you know, patient once I... Uh, give trinexamazole or something else. So when I get the improvement, I keep the patient in a kind of, you know, uh, kind of maintenance, which can be either kojic acid or arbutin or agilic acid, something, some of the drugs, which I, I find much more safer to uh, use for a longer period of time. So I'm glad you brought out the, the point about arbutin because arbutin is actually a hydroquinone derivative, but one which is non-phenolic. So one which has obviously, uh, you know, you get benefits that you would get with a low concentration of hydroquinone without the necessary side effects. Just uh, uh, just one pointer. Yeah. I mean, I know the arbutin and uh, agilic acid, these two molecules, when I use in Indian brands and Indians, sometimes we do not get adequate results. I'm going to come to see that. The, I, okay. I have that spe specific slide for azelaic acid where I'm going to ask you what, obviously, which one you use without telling the brand, which will be pretty simple. Um, but but that's, it has a very good data that I'm just trying to suggest. Very fantastic data they have. Correct. I do, I do agree with you. Indian brands, the ones which we have in a cream and a gel formulation, they don't work very well. So even when it comes to azelaic acid, I myself use a liposomal formulation. Very, very happy with it. Liposomal serum, even I use that. I think all of us will agree on that uh, at some point. But uh, Dr. Malvika, back to the uh, the big four that I've mentioned. Uh, what do you feel about Mequinol? I think Mequinol is the latest in our a basket belonging to the other groups of, I mean, the non-lightening, non-brightening groups. And I think uh, it holds promise. I have used it. Actually, pre-COVID, I had started using it. And, um, you hmm. know, it, uh, it was a good alternative. Again, when you know you want to use less of uh, the uh, tretinoin group, Again, when you want to use a tretinoin only twice a week or a retinol only twice a week, because with continual using usage, the skin gets thinner, drier, more photosensitive. So once you achieved good lightening of the melasma, then I find once again, putting the retinols to twice a week and then maybe initiating mequinol is, is, is a good plan because it works as a good, you know, uh, uh, they work well together. But then what happened in COVID, Dr. Asim, is that a lot of melasma vanished. <laughs> because people were at home and the mask and if they stepped out they went out with a mask so that you the mask became the savior for melasma so mask your melasma and so you know melasma actually uh, uh, there was a lot of improvement in a lot of my melasma patients but I, I've started again of course now things are open and we're, we're, we're seeing all our patients so I think mequinol is a good good molecule but mild it's mild again it becomes more of a blender I would still prefer retinol. I think retinol, like you said, hydroquinone is a gold standard. Triple combination is one, two. And I think tretinoin and its derivatives retinol will always remain the gold standard. In two to four weeks, you can see a difference, which in mequinol will take six to eight weeks. 
Correct. I, I think I'm glad you brought up that point. In fact, we should do a split phase study of uh, a three ply mask versus triple combination just on, <laughs> on a lighter note. But uh, Dr. Rashmi, as all panelists have harped upon tretinoin as well, do you also believe tretinoin is something which can continue for a longer period of time, not only for melasma, but you know, for the other added bonus effects that it has? Yeah, tretinoin is something, you know, which is very time time tested. All of us know that it is one of the first uh, drugs which has been approved not only for uh, pigmentation, but more importantly, aging. So, you know, and photo aging, as you know, is the new, um, you know, etiopathogenetic point, you know, which comes up in melasma. So it has that role. But having said that, the Indian skin finds it difficult to tolerate retinoin for a very long time, you know, with especially the 0.05%. So I would like to say when you have that kind of an issue, later on, you can add adaplin. You know, but because adaplin is an, another thing, you know, which you can give for a little longer period of time. So if you're not able to tolerate tretinoin, yes, try adaplin, you know, then you can play around and use any of these other agents with that. It's a good agent and you can use it for a long period of time. So good. So mm -hmm. vitamin A derivatives is what we'll call them now. Uh, yeah. The whole gambit, one of those will definitely, definitely aid your treatment with melasma. So I think good points from all the panelists. Abhishek, uh, starting with you again, since you and I were very excited about this molecule, I still feel it is underutilized and under underrated and very, very underutilized by us. Uh, maybe because, like you said, the common preparations that are available are uh, things which either people react to or I don't find them very effective in the long run. Maybe you will differ with me, maybe you won't. But uh, what do you feel about uh, the various vehicles that are available? And do you also use the derivatives? Now, there's a potassium as a loyal diglycinate uh, available. There is also an azeloglycolic acid available. So do you use the derivatives as well, or are you only uh, uh, fond of azelaic acid as a molecule? So uh, basically, first of all, uh, you know, what happened to azelaic acid, it got introduced to Indian market about when it was introduced, the molecules which was present, I mean, brands which was present, possibly not at par. And uh, most of them are very retained to skin. So doctors has kind of developed an apathy or, you know, averseness to this. And or they have started using it very low, like 10%. So that may not work. It has to be 15% and beyond. So that's when it starts working. So that's what the problem is. So what we found in last three or four years that there are liposomal derivatives of azelaic acids, which is a very strong data. You know, if you see the azelaic acid data in melasma and even acne and acne pH is a very, very strong data. So, and it's it has safe for long period of time use. It's safe for use in pregnancy also. So this is another advantage it has. So this is something a molecule I like. But the problem is the most of the brands, uh, which is uh, like much little cheaper, is may not be as good or rather irritant to the skin. And uh, some patient may develop kind of contact dermatitis sort of reaction like, like we've seen with retinoids also. So if we have a good quality azelaic acid, 15% and beyond in a liposomal syrup derivative, that's a fantastic drug. So great. I think I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, so for everybody who has given up on azelaic acid, it would be a good idea to try the liposomal formulation. You might get hooked on to it once again. Yeah, Asim, could I yes. just add here? Yes, know? please. Yes, ma'am. If you uh, both are very excited about azelaic acid, I was always super excited. You know, it's a gut yes. feeling. Correct. You just know Correct. who's your friend. Yes. So this was 20 years back when this my paper came up, you know, in dermatology. And it had the azelaic acid cream. And why was it irritating? although very good because it had a lot of impurities. It's the way you manufacture it. Now with the introduction of the latest ones, the liposomal preparations and the gels and the 15%, let me tell you, it is a very good one and it's almost supposed to be as good as hydroquinone and we can use it for a long time without side effects. So we need to stay more with azelaic acid. There is one more uh, double combination of azelaic acid with the tretinoin. With tretinoin. It's cream based. Yes. That's right. also very good. Uh, yeah. That actually that became my first line of choice in these days for uh, acne PAH as well as melasma, and, and the liposomal serum was there in the market, and then I love that product since long. And Dr. Asim would also yeah. yeah, I'd also like to add that you know what Dr. Padma said is absolutely true. You know when you have patients of adult acne and melasma then this uh, tretinoin azelaic acid combination is wonderful. And like Dr. Padma said, you can start it as a first line. But, you know, azelaic acid is, you know, like uh, one of these uh, um, um, pepper salts that, you know, you're talking about cocktails. It's like Angostura bitters. You can add it to any drink. So it's, it, it, it can also combine with a lot of other 
um, uh, uh, combinations like arbutin, kojic acid. Uh, it, it can combine with glycolic acid. It can combine with salicylic acid. So, you know, it, it's a great molecule. And there are one or two international brands that I do sometimes ask my patients to pick up. Some are available on Amazon. Some they'll have to procure if they travel, when they travel. Uh, earlier, they used to travel a lot. And uh, those brands work beautifully, not just in melasma, but even in PIH and rosacea, in acne. So I think, uh, uh, you know, azelic acid is, uh, if we have the right molecule, is probably going to reach first line very soon. True. So True. I'm happy all, I'm happy everybody is unanimous on this. We do need to use more and more of azelic acid. And like Dr. Malvika has rightly mentioned, we can combine it with a lot of, like a host of other modalities. We'll move on to the acids. So uh, alpha hydroxy acids, uh, Dr. Rashmi, I'm going to start with you. Glycolic, mandelic, I've not added lactic, uh, pyruvic and uh, um, phytic acid on purpose. We'll talk about the big guns first. <laughs> yeah, Asim, this is something that I really love, you know. All of them, you know, my babies, you know, whether it's the glycolic one, the mandelic one or the salicylic one, I think they're just wonderful. And of course, the glycolic one is versatile, but you have to be still careful. It looks innocuous. But uh, you have to recognize that burning sensation if you're not able to see the redness. So you have to use it, but when you're playing around with it, please be very careful. Mandelic is a very good uh, you know, chemical peel now, which is around, whether it is mandelic acid plain or in combination with other things. It's a wonderful agent to use for pigmentation, maybe post-acne uh, pigmentation and so many other things, melasma also, melasma and post-acne pigmentation. Salicylic is versatile, especially when you have an oily skin and you're having post-acne hyperpigmentation, little bit of acne and melasma, nothing like it. All these singly or in combination work absolutely well. What you're talking about, the PHAs, some of them are uh, proprietary peels, as you know. So you may know only the total content, but having said that, they are much more tolerant for a, maybe you, know, you don't have to worry about the side effects. So they have more of art in them Whereas these older agents, glycolic and salicylic, have a lot of science in them. You know, so you need to choose you whether you want to play with that, but use them carefully. So art versus science, I think that's wonderfully put by you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Malvika, polyhydroxy acids, uh, cousin sisters of alpha hydroxy acids. Mm -hmm. Do you feel we need more science there, or uh, are you fairly happy with what we have right now? I think we need more science. We need more evidence. But if in clinical, if you took look at it in practice and in clinical use, what are we seeing? Because sometimes that's the you know, proof of the pudding is in the eating. So if you uh, look at it, I think it's very well accepted across age groups. Anywhere from 18 up to 40, 50, no problem. Very well accepted, very good for sensitive skin. It's also a you know, very simple program you can follow off because it causes exfoliation, cell renewal and hydration. It uh, just, if you have, uh, one one PHA in your skincare regimen, it is serving quite a few you know functions, and uh, therefore it's 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 very versatile. It's very versatile. So and I think in the acids, the PHAs are going to slowly gain more popularity if they can also be backed, as you said, with evidence. And I think mandelic acid is one of my getting to be one of my favorites, and that's because when it's in a peel or a cream or a face wash, it can be good for somebody who needs very quick results and where you can't start with a glycolic right away. So with whichever form it is, it's a great starting point also for melasma, hyperpigmentation, especially on the body a lot of body peels and body work. And it can combine with lasers very well. I alternate sometimes mandelic acid creams or peels along with the Q-switched laser for body pigmentation. Yeah, you can't use large areas, you know, salicylic acid okay. and even glycolic. So that is where these are handy and polyhydroxy acids are good. That's why they contain most of these acids. You know, True. Lactopionic and the gluconolactone. Yeah, lactopionic. So, yeah. Exactly. So perfect. I think good tips on all the acids, the alpha hydroxy acids, the beta hydroxy acids, and do watch out for polyhydroxy acids. They will be the molecules of the future. Let's start with newer, let's move on to, sorry, newer kids on the block. Uh, Dr. Padmavati, niacinamide. Is it overhyped? Every single pharmaceutical company, medical or non-medical, dermatological or non-dermatological, they have a niacinamide serum. Are we heading for disaster or does it actually work as well as it's purported? Uh, niacinamide is hyped not only with the pharmaceuticals, with the patients also. <laughs> every girl walks into the patient. clinic, they want a niacinamide serum. They get one or two serums, the friends are using, they are using and they want an advice on it. 
but I, I feel like it's Nifamide it's is a it's good uh, it's lightning agent for a maintenance as well as for hydration maybe. It, it cannot be a first line drug, but it can be a, in the cocktail. It can be in the cocktail because it, it acts on a it stops the transfer of melanosin. Correct. It's one of those few agents which can actually stop the transfer of melanosin. So, but it doesn't reduce the synthesis of uh, a melanin. Melanin. So, so it always... can be added as a cocktail or can be a maintenance. But most of the girls they use for the, the glow what they want, the hydration and the glow with yes. my mind. Yes. But in melasma, I think it should be a cocktail or a maintenance. Well said. Well said. Uh, Dr. Rashmi Silimarin, I know you've done research on the molecule for melasma. Uh, it's available only as one formulation that we have, but uh, yeah. do we need more evidence here or um, how do we place this molecule now? Yeah, you're talking about silymarine, no? Yes, yes, ma'am. Silymarine, I haven't really done research, but yes, I've used it. See, silymarine, again, is a much milder agent. So it's, again, a good maintenance regime. The good part is it has made a kind of a comeback. All these agents were there. The problem was they were always used in combination with a lot more agents. Nobody knew which part of the cocktail was working. Given. So now the only thing is that, you know, it is there in its own form, silymarine, with just one or two other things. And I think it's a good agent to use when you once used stronger agents and you want to give an interval because that's how you should do. Use a stronger agent, rotate with another uh, non-hydroquinone agent, and then come back again. So that way, Sally Marine is a good uh, maintenance uh, agent. Agreed. Uh, Dr. Malvika, curcumin yeah. derivatives, they obviously the, uh, they, they seem to stop alpha MSH themselves. They act at a very higher level. But uh, in practice, how do you find them? <clears throat> See, uh, Dr. Asim, there is no preparation with curcumin alone. Correct. So it's always combined with one of these or maybe even a few <clears throat> more. So my take is now that if you look at products, like what Dr. Padmavati was saying, we have a whole generation of Insta information. Whatever is trending on Insta is what our patients will come and ask us, right? So what I feel is that if I see a, a, a product which has a cocktail of any one of these mix and match, except for resorcinol, that I would take out of this cocktail and talk about it a little for just a minute, a uh, few seconds, is that I will look at all the ingredients and see which of these ingredients is in its correct percentage. The rest all become, you know, uh, oregano and become uh, your chili flakes <laughs> and all that, you know. So I like to see that which one is the, the which, which one of these ingredients is in its correct percentage. And if it's so, then I know that it's going to work. And if that's going to work, then the rest is going to help it. It's as simple as that. I'm just saying this so that, you know, our listeners can learn how to choose products for their patients and how not to get into marketing and not get swayed also by packaging and by, you know, a lot of Insta information in flux and also getting a little pressure from patients because we also have to seem like we know it all, you know. There is that little pressure that comes in, especially with pigmentation because we're Indian, because we're Asian. So I would say that I would take out resorcinol only because, yes, I completely agree with your comment. Resorcinol has made a worthy comeback. And that's because it's really versatile again. It's coming back in so many ways. Peels and uh, lotions and uh, serums and all of that, body face. So I, I think resorcinol is great. I think curcumin, we really don't know. Curcumin is now coming orally also. Supposed to be great, but we really don't know. The dose now, they've increased of curcumin orally. I would say curcumin orally may be a better better than curcumin top topically. Okay. And what about Brightnil, ma'am? Just finish the list for me, please. Sure. sure. Brightnil, topical glutathione, we all know now, you know. Yeah. We, we all know. So, <laughs> Brightnil, I think, is promising. I think Brightnil has now come out in a more intense form, a uh, higher percentage. I think, again, I would love to use the word a blender for it. It's a great treatment as a blender. It cannot be a sole product you're going to use. But if you want to sort of, sometimes patients have melasma, a bit of freckling, a bit of tanning, some PDLs, you know, patients have all of this on their face. It's a great blender. It's a lovely moisturizer, feel good. And then you can put some actives over it, True. specifically for what you want to treat. So good. So as a layering agent or as an additive, I think that's a good placement of uh, uh, this molecule. And thank you very much, everyone, for uh, the other tips. Abhishek, I'm going to throw a googly at you now. The honorable extracts. Now, these are again, uh, I'll call them outfielders. You have licorice, obviously, that is glabridin. You have mulberry extract, you have grape seed, pine bark, soy. 
how important is it for your products the the ones that you prescribe for them to have either of these there are also preparations of up to 40% licorice which actually do have uh, you know some role to play but but where would you place them in your uh, armamentarium must be very less and uh, i'm honestly i I'll, I'll, I'll the other two charts what you had how do men much love to stay there because there uh, there are very less information available as far as when it comes to science about it if you see equipment only data is is there uh, which is basically uh, in vitro study not like uh, any any study which is in vivo and these are all more you know uh, some nutrition is suggested somewhere it's as reported hardly any trial hardly any uh, data we have so i i mean i know all the patients comes up with and i get uh, you know dp is every day okay doc this is going on what to do and this is very difficult to and in fact for us doctors in a dermatology and cosmetology practice to stay in touch with uh, today's uh, science and instagram is very difficult correct if they, if they have any role it must be uh, very minimal one thing about putting too many thing in a combination in a very low uh, you know lot of people gets uh, gets very you know um, encouraged by sudden over the counter uh, molecule because a v i a v i vitamin c v i correct uh, i mean vitamin a v i everything is there in but one thing you have to understand that first of all you need to have that product in a right concentration and also in right ph many of these uh, acids which they have a particular pka where they are work as a deuterizer and they can work on that if you just have some ph then some of the molecule may be working others are completely inactive so just putting them together is also not a solution so we have to take this with a pinch of salt i'll say at this for the time time being science is progressive maybe 10 years down the line i can say different words correct maybe we'll have another review panel 10 years hence to see where these molecules stand maybe we won't have them on the slide at all i think picnogen picnogenol is is of value when you have insulin resistance and acanthosis nigricans that i think is of value in combination with b6 in combination with zinc in combination chromium uh, specifically for uh, and zinc yeah specifically for acanthosis nigricans orally it does work orally yeah orally. not topically man not topically that's why i said orally that's, that's what i'm saying yeah so even yeah. even proanthus and it actually they're all from the same family so i think that yes. True. but how this nicotinamide which is supposed to be a very common drug from long time yeah. how can that be a you know super um, uh, super heat molecule right at this moment that, that is very surprising that, that is the beauty of advertising let me tell you that that is the whole that is that is how everything is happening 10% niacinamide is be marketed for acne acne scars pigmentation everything very soon we'll have only niacinamide in our systems that's how every patient who comes to us has niacinamide already whether they tell you that or they don't that is the power of marketing <laughs> actually asim niacinamide has been around for a long time okay true, true, it didn't pick up so much because again it was used in combination of late what happened is they had trials with niacinamide alone you know where they found it to work quite well as a skin lightening agent in us it is doing quite well you know like, like as um, an alternative to maybe hydroquinone and even oh, azelaic mm -hmm. acid maybe not as strong as that but somewhere along the line it is well so maybe it is data extrapolated from there but in the indian setup i think at best it's one, just a mild maintenance therapy one ma'am one good thing about niacinamide it also has an anti inflammatory property sometimes mm. the patients come with you know lot of infl inflammation and uh, they have already used some hydroquinone and they have developed some retinoid dermatitis yeah there's a barrier yeah, yeah. Uh, so it has a niacinamide serum and may have some role mm. on those patient because also of because of the inflammatory properties tsdf that's why i can use it also use niacinamide yeah decongestant inflammation great. great i think great inputs i think we can skip tranexamic acid we all know it definitely definitely works uh, the only thing i want to know from each panelist is what is the maximum duration of oral tranexamic acid that you give uh, we'll start with dr padma uh, i'll give it for 4 to 6 months depending on how uh, the patient is responding max is 6 months not more than that okay anybody giving it over 6 months no currently it is 6 months but it can actually be given little longer we don't really have guidelines about testing and all that but you should yeah ideally there is some paper testing. yeah it may be too much of a good thing you know so we have to be there is some paper which suggests it it can be given for 21 months at, uh, 
yes, also I, there are I papers read that paper as well yes uh, but then uh, usually for you know most common purposes four to six months is the right duration what we choose or we can give a drug holiday and restart it you know yeah, that you can do three month break and then restart it and also therefore your whole dvt complications and all also you know you don't want to overdose because of all those issues especially in menopausal women and especially post covid with the pro coagulation yes, becoming of yes of course so uh, i have a set of oral sunscreens uh, dr padma i would want you to take that now we won't go over the fda approval because the fda was quite clear of mm. people staying away from sunscreen pills because they said it doesn't protect you from photocarcinogenesis but moving closer home for pigmentation do you find any of these molecules having a role in your practice or again do you give them as adjuvants do you replace more importantly uh, topical sunscreens with any of them i don't replace uh, oral sunscreens with the topical sunscreens but whenever they need an extra protection like you know the uh, they are working more of outdoors or they are going for a holiday then i use them as a extra protection because all these are like you know uh, they they are strong antioxidants they can prevent uv damage so polypodium is my first uh, choice then comes the astaxanthin and then superoxide dismutase is one thing which i want to add and a combination of vitamin c and e a combination of both that also gives a good protection in my practice whenever i see glutathione i don't use as an oral sunscreen um yeah beta carotene is another one the it, it's a time tested uh, antioxidant which can definitely protect from uv damage correct correct can i be the devil's advocate over here for just please, a second please. Okay. <laughs> see if i have to choose see let's remember these oral sunscreens add a lot of uh, expense to the prescription right the heavier we make up prescription the more the patient has to spend and then they start making their own choices if they start making their own choice and they begin to you apply a cheaper less i don't mind I mean cheaper in terms of price a less effective topical sunscreen to be able to take the oral sunscreen then the whole purpose is defeated i would like to stress on them using the appropriate sunscreen in an appropriate manner with the appropriate topical formal asthma and then stress on the oral sometimes you know the prescription becomes so heavy it's also not easy to do so i feel that the oral sunscreens are like to prescribe but it's not uh, i'm not going to replace the strength of my prescription with an oral sunscreen it would come later it would come later in my priorities so they're useful all of these are useful but they've never been used alone they're always a cocktail again correct correct but if i have to choose something cheap cheerful friendly effective 1000 mg vitamin c is always i think as a gold standard now almost if you want to use it effectively it works well put ma'am well put thank you Um, Rashmi, ma'am, I'm going to trouble you with nutraceuticals now. Uh, is ma'am screen frozen? No, I can't. Muted, uh, ma'am. Yeah, muted. Some of these nutraceuticals have been around, and uh, you know they do have a role. You know, in you in melasma as well as uh, other hyperpigmentation on the face. The only issue is they are around as an adjuvant. you know having said that one of their roles is as i said very you know the other um, agents also is you know barrier repair many of them do have their antioxidants a large number of them are antioxidants and they play a role in barrier repair so that is how these are important so some of these polysaccharides for example they are good they are quite good they are pre uh, present in some of the otc products also so that is when you have to do and the bioactive peptides anything you know which of course enhances the collagen also makes the skin look lighter overall so that is where these nutraceuticals are good as an adjuvant but again they add a lot to the cost of treatment as dr malvika has said so i think use it as your third or fourth line of treatment agreed ma'am thank you for laying that down i think that was a great point because a lot of collagen shots and collagen supplements doing the rounds now uh dr uh, just can may i make a point yes yes please i mean collagen may not have that much of a, a result in case of melasma as such but it definitely have some role in anti aging if you see that to a fantastic meta analysis which has got published between 2019 and 20 which uh, suggests that you know uh, it has a role in anti aging so it 
for melasma topic yes possibly it has very very ill defined role but then it has certain thing to do it uh, anti aging you know uh, and mid phase volume loss all those things do yeah certain data for that auto aging also see that's what i said that it overall makes the skin look lighter it's not that it's really having a role you know so it's yeah. combining the two things even on the photo plumps of the skin yeah there's a lot of plumping up of the skin so the plumping light of the skin yeah. so the light reflects exactly the light reflex changes off the skin and that gives a brighter appearance true and and since we are on collagen even amongst the collagens i think we should look for a bioactive collagen peptide that bioactive is obviously the one peptide, that we yeah. studied mm-hmm. the most 5000 international units per day absolutely bang on <laughs> so uh, cosmeceuticals i think all of us love them patients love them very very high cosmetic tolerability uh, we have dermatopoietin based molecules dr malvika what is your experience with them uh, do you feel we have a big market for this or do you feel again they are just uh, you know running behind the big guns just for attention or how do you place them so dermatopoietin is a signaling peptide and i think it's uh, i've been using it now um, a year plus um a year and a half i have to say that they they they're a little more expensive but you know they really save the day in these very very extensively damaged cases and advanced cases of lichen planus pigmentosus of photo damage or very severe melasma uh patients who have a lot of um, you know uh, even aging uh, photo aging and aging but they're very well formulated and very well uh, 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 compliance is great and they're very easy to use not much has to be used and they have have they, they are there is something about them there is something about it it really you know contributes to a healthier skin so if the i find that it's not it's not that every patient needs to use dermatopoietin but if you if you have a difficult case and they've already been around and you've run out of molecules sometimes it really saves the day it has a it works it really works but you don't have to give it to every patient and don't it doesn't have to be first line great great point ma'am uh, dr abhishek they extended the royal retinol family <laughs> as cosmeceuticals ah uh, yeah uh, vitamin c and uh, retinol family all has a role in improving the texture improving the skin color improving everything but if you talk about therapeutic such melasma possibly they have a very uh, limited role but uh, you can always give this as in you know add on to your treatment uh, depending on the patient's expectation and you know most of the patient who comes to uh, us and possibly already be using some amount of vitamin c or uh, retin also you depending on what the patient skin type you can choose a right product for them that is good for them but if you uh, tell me ki whether it helps too much on the treatment of melasma may not be may not be one imp- one molecule which can be interesting for melasma and many other pigmentary diseases which is ferulic acid so that acid. Uh, something uh, we, it got missed uh, in those glycolic acid panel Correct. in the acids well put well put dr rashmi you mentioned in sort of retinoin we can move patients to adapalene do you also feel retinols can fill a need gap in case patients cannot tolerate obviously we don't get too many patients who don't tolerate adapalene but in any case would you consider them in the same spectrum or are retinols a totally different uh, uh, genre of molecules for you yeah retinols are definitely a value added product but they are more of cosmeceuticals you know the real science as i said lies either in retinoin or it lies you know with adapalene adapalene is also a slightly weaker agent we don't have so much experience with tazrotin another molecule which is ill understood but probably something that we should look into more you know with time but the retinols are definitely milder agents and at the most i would say that they are cosmeceuticals but both retinols as well as ascorbic acid and derivatives are time tested and they work well with other agents maybe alone they may not work so well so they are kind of just have that shine effect you know what you can say correct so i think great points by the panel on everything and i think we just have uh, uh, shreel do we have enough time for a couple of questions uh dr asim actually we're too pressed on time but what i'll suggest is if you can quickly look at the q and a box and just take maybe your two most relevant questions so sure, the rest of I the questions we'll respond to it post the event sure sure so i'm also uh, looking at them yeah. vitamin c has been dealt with mm-hmm. uh, please elaborate on topical tranexamic acid anybody any panelist it's useful especially in telangiectatic melasma i use my dermoscope when i see a thinner skin when the patient gives history of you know of uh, of a lot of uh, 
they were the homemakers and those who have very fragile skin mm -hmm. see a dermoscope and you see the telangiectasias over there then i find it particularly useful in that kind of melasma okay uh, may i make a point here yes please yes yes yeah there have been studies which has been compared oral tranexamic acid to the interlesional tranexamic acid to the topical tranexamic acid and topical tranexamic acid is found to be least effective but it is effective that's an important point so uh, so in case you cannot give oral tranexamic acid for patient who have dvt or apla or something like that then topical tranexamic acid interlesional tranexamic acid still have a good role to play but wherever you can give oral tranexamic acid i think that is a better choice perfect uh, i think uh, one more question uh, uh, do you, are you uh, is any of you worried about the after effects of resorcinol in terms of ochronosis no never seen it never, never seen it it doesn't happen never seen it at ochron okay yes yes ochronosis there, there are some uh, uh, products which have hydroquinone with resorcinol correct so hydroquinone yeah. more than the resorcinol true 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 it's actually used you know more uh, in other countries you know where it's mixed actually with hydroquinone exactly so you have it's an impurity sometimes also and it's used along with you know hydroquinone and even mercury for that matter and resorcinol they're not supposed to be there actually mm -hmm. but they have a whitening effect so that is where the ochronosis comes from you know it's in africa where resorcinol does cause a whole lot of ochronosis but not so much of a concern here we don't have You, we are not using so much of resorcinol here in India. True. And the last question is actually to Dr. Malvika, but I think uh, she wants to know what Dr. Megha Gulati wants to know what products you uh, uh, get from the US. I think she will get in touch with you after the session. Yeah, yeah. That we have no contact with her. I'll share that on a DM, sure, or an email. Please send me. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Rashmi, Dr. Malvika, Dr. Abhishek, and Dr. Padma. I this was a great uh, panel discussion. I learned a lot from all of you. and i'm handing it back to uh, shriyal yes thank you uh, dr asim sharma for leading this detailed session and our entire panel dr rashmi sarkar dr padmavati srupaneni dr malvika kohli and dr abhishek de uh, thank you for this very informative uh, discussion uh, we now move on to our third session for today it's an international perspective on prp for melasma by dr teresita ferraris board of director international society for dermatologic surgery in philippines uh, dr teresita ferraris is a double board certified in dermatology and cosmetic surgery she is a fellow of philippine dermatological society as well as philippine society for cosmetic surgery a scientific committee member of imcas asia she is also an international mentor of the american society for dermatologic surgery international traveling mentorship program and today she will be speaking on the principles of melasma therapy and why melasma is recurring and while melasma is recurring and resistant to treatment what makes prp a good alternative and an adjuvant in the treatment of long standing melasma requesting dr teresita to take the session forward you would have 15 minutes for the session and over to you from here hi good evening uh thank you for inviting me uh thank you for, uh, to my friend uh apartin goel for recommending me so um i'm glad to be here i'm still so honored okay um so my uh, i have to share my uh slides yes you would see the share screen option at the bottom of your screen yeah okay Perfect. you see it yes you could just go to the slide show and maximize your screen okay thank you yes we can see it i can i just um need to you have to remove Can can somebody um, get the view of here? Okay, we we can see it, doctor. Oh, hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. So um, good evening. So my topic for tonight is um PRP for melasma. My personal experience. I have no conflict of interest in this presentation. How come I can't move it? Okay, okay. So, um, melasma is a commonly acquired disorder of hyperpigmentation, which commonly affects women. 
Usually it is seen on prototype three and four, same with Indians and the Philippines. So it is characterized by light brown to gray brown patches and sun exposed areas and predominantly seen on the face and uh, cheeks, the forehead, the upper lip, the nose and the chin. It is usually symptomatic with non antecedent and inflammatory reaction. And because of this condition, it usually gives a negative impact on the quality of life of the patient. So the etiology is multifactorial, usually uh, uh, seen with genetic predisposition, UV radiation, with hormonal changes, and also seen in anti-epileptic medications and those with thyroid dysfunction. Uh, what are the principles of melasma therapy? Um, usually it's uh, protection from sun exposure, inhibition of tyrosinase activity, the removal of melanin with the use of your chemical peels, destruction or disruption of melanin granules using your lasers. So the mainstay of, of treatment is usually the sunscreen and then the topical uh, medications and then um, the use of the chemical pills you can use as, as the primary treatment or as an adjuvant treatment. And these are the other uh, topical medications. And I believe that the, this were discussed earlier. And so we have this, um, the oral medications that we can also give, alcanexamic acid, the glutathione, the polypodium lipatomas. And this were um, already discussed in the previous uh, session. And we have the, uh, for the physical therapy of the, the platinum kill, the microdermabrations, and the lasers, which in with proper protocol will help in the treatment of melasma. So how do I manage my melasma? So first, um, these are the topical meds. So as I, I listened to the previous speakers, I also agree that, um, uh, of course, the Kligmas formula is the gold standard for the treatment of melasma. But then I also shy away with uh, giving this um, uh, Kligmas formula in all of my patients, okay? But if I give it to my patients, I give it uh, for three months and then uh, taper them depending on the response of the patients. Okay? But uh, I usually stop it at three months to avoid ochronosis. Then I give a vitamin C serum and I also give hydrocortisone 1% for at least two weeks. This is because uh, there is an inflammatory reaction that is seen in, the, in melasma. And also I give oral medications like polypodium leucotomas, which is a... Um, Protective agent, a glutathione is an antioxidant, ascorbic acid which stabilizes your uh, bleaching agents, the tranexamic acid, which is uh, we should be uh, careful in giving uh, this uh, tranexamic acid because it is a coagulant. So make sure that the patient is not pregnant, not taking on, uh, uh, contraceptive pills, and she has no history of deep vein thrombosis. So I usually give it just uh, two to eight weeks. It really, it really depends. And then uh, like a rotation therapy, I give acylate acid, licorice cream, kojic acid, the nexamic acid gel, and the vitamin E. For the treatment of melasma, really, you cannot, you cannot just uh, treat, uh, you can't give only one or two um, uh, medicines or topical or oral. You really have to repeat. You have to, to check. So uh, what uh, medicines are, uh, are effective on this particular patient? So it is not... Uh, one all uh, uh, treatment. So I also do ke uh, chemical peel. So I, I do every three months for one year. I do combination uh, combination peel. I do glycolic 70% uh, first, and then on uh, um, addition of uh, TCA 20%. This is to enhance the the effect of the absorb the absorbance of um, uh, TCA. And then we can do also the mechanical peel, like the diamond peel, the platinum peel. So really it is like a, um, a rotation uh, treatment. So and then my, my, my uh, uh, last uh, option is the platelet rich plasma, plus the facial oxygen uh, infusion. So what is PRP? It is an autologous product derived from your own blood, having a platelet concentration above the baseline value. So the platelets, also known as your thrombocytes, are tiny blood cells that help form clots to stop bleeding. So these concentrated platelets found in PRP contains huge reservoir of bioactive proteins, which includes our uh, growth factors and signaling proteins, 
that are vital to initiate and accelerate tissue repair and regeneration. And then also in plasma, you, you can see all the vitamins, the hormones, electrolytes that can also add or help in the treatment of our melasma. So according to Dr. Jeremy Magalon, a French pharmacologist in a recent impasse webinar on PRP and regenerative medicine, the scientific proof of bone and soft tissue healing enhancement has been shown using PRP with 1 million platelets per microliter in a 5 ml volume of plasma, and which is the working definition of PRP today. So meaning that lesser concentrations cannot be relied upon to enhance wound healing, and even greater concentrations higher than sixfold compared with a platelet whole blood based on level have not yet been shown to further enhance healing. So we should uh, take note of that. So what is the mechanism of action of PRP? So let's start with uh, um, the granules that are um, present in the in PRP, okay, in the, in the platelets. So the alpha granules that are that are located on the membrane of the of the platelets has the important intracellular storage pool of growth factors, which include your platelet-derived growth factors, your transforming growth factors, and your insulin-like growth factors that are vital to wound healing. And so on activation, these alpha granules will fuse with the platelet cell membrane and they activate the secretory proteins to bioactive state. And this uh, 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 transforming uh, this, uh, growth factors bind to the transmembrane receptors on the target cells, okay? And these target cells are your epidermal cells, your mesenchymal cells, and your fibroblast. Then inducing an internal uh, signal transduction pathway, thereby increasing the expression of various gene sequences in cells like your cell proliferation, your collagen synthesis, synthesis, and your antitoxins. So these are your... Um, growth factors. So how do we um, prepare the PRP? So I think everybody's already um, uh, familiar with the uh, process of PRP and only the, P, the, the process only differ with, with the device that we use, you know, depending on the, the, the companies, you know, because sometimes we, we, we extract, we extract uh, 10 ml of blood, others they extract 40 ml of blood. So it really, it really depends. But all of the same, you do a centrifugation and then you, you get your PRP. So how do you activate your PRP? So there are several ways to activate your PRP. So several years ago, I uh, attended a meeting at the INCAS meeting and then I heard this from Dr. Otto Jakes that lidocaine with epinephrine uh, activates the platelets to release growth factors in place of calcium uh, chloride or calcium gluconate and it does not clot easily, which is true enough. If you, if you uh, uh, use uh, calcium gluconate, gluconate the, the platelets easily um, clots, okay? But recent report revealed that lidocaine is toxic to stem cells and even topical is not advised. So um, that's from Dr. Menke. So we can just um, observe. The pinpoint bleeding in the roller are enough to activate the platelets. And the thrombin, this is quite controversial because um, others say that um, it's not advisable to use the thrombin, especially the bovine thrombin, because it might be contaminated. And then the dermocollagen and inflammation. Collagen is the natural activator of PRP. Thus, when injected into the soft tissue, it doesn't need to be exogen exogenously activated. And I believe in this, so I don't use exogenous um, activator anymore. And radiofrequency can activate platelets and promote collagenesis. It affects the deeper tissue plane, whereas PRP is injected superficially. So there may be potential synergy for multiplane multi skin rejuvenation. So here's a short video on how I do it. So I do the intradermal injection. Uh, I usually do uh, four sessions at uh, two to four weeks interval, and then I repeat after six months, and then repeat uh, once a year. So I usually start with a lower eyelid uh, injection, 
at one centimeter um, uh, interval because it's good for periorbital rejuvenation, uh, even all the lower eyelid um, pigmentation and also for improvement of the fine lines. So that's how I do it. So irrespective of the method of activation, the release of fat gut factors starts within 10 minutes of clot initiation and more than 95% of secretion is completed within an hour. So PRP must be applied within 10 minutes of activation. So here are my before and after photos. So I have a revelation. Uh, this is me. I had this uh, 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 pigmentation before. I suffered uh, for with I suffered from melasma. That's why I discovered uh, PRP on myself. So this is before, and this is after five years with uh, se several treatments, seven treatments. But of course, I use a uh, vitamin C serum and the anti-aging uh, serum, the colic uh, pills, the sunscreen, and my favorite also the intracheatical oxygen infusion. So this is a 45-year-old female with melasma of, of a year. Then this is after one treatment. Here's another patient which I treated for, with, uh, which I did PRP and microneedling for her um, um, acne, uh, no, acne scars and also even the melasma improved. This is after um, seven months with just one session. There is another patient of mine who's suffering of of melasma for 10 years, okay? This is after 11 months of seven treatments and this is after 10 treatments. Another view. So this is another uh, patient of mine. So this one, I just use um, um, uh, sunscreen without any other uh, um, treatments, okay? There's still improvement with just PRP. So how does PRP work in melasma? So here, um, uh, autologous PRP releases growth factors, cytokines and chemokines that promote cell proliferation and differentiation, as well as a mechanism to improve pigmentation. And one of this is the inhibition of the tyrosinase by transforming growth factor beta-1, which leads to the inhibitions of melanin synthesis. And another growth factors, the intradermal, uh, epidermal growth factors, which lowers the melanin production in melanocytes by inhibiting the PGE2 expression and tyrosinase activity. So these are some studies of uh, the role of PRP in melasma, where the mass score of PRP significantly improved. There's another more, some more. And here's the hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy that I used. This is an intraceutical infusion application method that utilizes hyperbaric oxygen to promote the delivery of intraceutical serums to the skin. The infuser creates a hyperbaric pressure bubble to initiate osmotic hydration and activate delivery. There's also the infusion of opulent serum. And also th there is a citrus onchofil extract, which is a type of Japanese mandarin that breaks up surface melanin uh, buildup. And also you see that the, the um, um, oxygen eradicates the uh, ROS, the, the free radicals. So in conclusion, PRP is a good alternative in the treatment of long-standing melasma, but it is not a standalone treatment. For optimal result, it may be combined with other treatment modalities like topicals, microneedling, chemical peeling, and lasers and oral medications. Due to limited studies on clinical efficacy and safety, Further studies are required to investigate the mechanism of action behind the therapeutic effects of PRP and its long-term safety. And PRP uses our own body's natural platelets, so there is no risk of allergic reaction. And the natural collagen is formed in response to the presence of the activated platelets. And PRP can be used to enhance several procedures for faster and improved healing. And remember, smoking and alcohol intake diminish stem cell release. So remember also that um, PRP works on inflammation. So the use of anti-inflammatory drugs is not recommended. And this restriction should be in place for about one to two weeks before and after. And what are the factors that increase the number of stem cell release? The vitamin B3, green tea extract, blueberry extract. 
and radiofrequency can activate the platelets and promote collagenesis. So if you remember all of this, then this can enhance the, the, the effectiveness of our treatment of PRP. So thank you very much. So I invite you to the Philippines after the pandemic at the, our paradise in Apantulo, Palawan. So I was here three years ago. This is, that was before the pandemic. And now that it's pandemic time, I only uh, enjoy my um, fishes in my aquarium, the little aquarium in our province in the, here in the, in the Philippines. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Teresita, for this informative session and also for joining us today. In fact, uh, initially, when you would have seen, we had a lot of questions on, uh, you know, this topic, which I think you did answer as they came along as well. So you could stop your screen share right now. Uh, yes. And uh, with that, okay. uh, we move on to our fourth and next session for today, which will focus on an international perspective on procedural options in melasma management. And may I invite Dr. Raj Tethi, founder of Yorkshire Skin Center from the UK to join us for the same. A brief introduction to him before he takes over. Dr. Raj has extensive knowledge and experience in treating melasma and cloasma and other pigmentation disorders. He uses a range of different techniques and modalities. He is also a member of the National Editorial Board of Aesthetic Medicine magazine in the UK. And today he will be sharing a global perspective on procedural options in melasma management. Requesting Dr. Raj to take the session forward from you, you would have 15 minutes for your session. Over to you. Hi, Shreya. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, all the panelists. It's been absolutely amazing to hear all of your experiences. Some very, very, um, very, very notable speakers. And I was very impressed with the panel discussion earlier. I think there was a lot of really, really good points covered, some of which I'm going to be talking about in my, in my session, um, but obviously talking in much, much more depth because we've only got 15 minutes. I am going to try and do a screen share. Give me one second. And hopefully... You should be able to see. Can you see my screen or not? Yes, uh, I can see that it's sharing the screen. I'm yet to see the presentation though. One second, sorry guys. One second, apologies. Just one second, I'm just gonna stop sharing for one sec. I'm just gonna try and bring up the presentation. Uh, I'm so sorry. Give me one second, guys. Yes, yes, sure. It's just jammed. Just give me one second. I'm so sorry. Yes. In the open. meanwhile, I would just like to tell... I've had it open for the last hour and a half. <laughs> and then just now it decides to freeze on me. Just give me one second. Yes, yes, absolutely. In the meanwhile, I would like to tell all my attendees, I can see a lot of questions coming to us and thank you for, um, you know, bringing in these questions. We're also seeing that a lot of your questions are being answered even in the sessions to follow, uh, which is the reason why we haven't taken a lot of these questions. But please keep putting in your questions into the Q&A box. If due to time constraints, we are unable to take them now, we'll take them at the end of the uh, entire event or we would ensure that the responses to your questions uh, are shared with you post the event. So um, yes, and in the meanwhile, our website aestheticmedicine.in is uh, always available to keep you up to date with everything that we do and all our events that you know we come up with. In fact, even key takeaways from our uh, entire event and our five sessions today are going to be available on our website as well for you to go through um, if you have missed any part of today's event. Apart from that, of course, uh, we also have our YouTube channel where we have a lot of our past events uploaded for all of you to, you know, see um, and gain a lot of knowledge from. Uh, also, we are there on all channels, social media as well, Facebook and Instagram. So continue following us. We've been very active over there with a lot of news on a day to day basis and uh, as well as with a lot of live sessions. Uh, today's event on melasma and hyperpigmentation, the Indian and global perspective uh, that we've been looking at. Uh, we've had a perfect mix of uh, a theoretic discussion and now we have been moving into the 
procedural part of discussion. Uh, following Dr. Raj's uh, presentation, we're going to be having a panel discussion with uh, some leading and experienced dermatologists from India on the subject matter as well. So continue staying with us for uh, that as well. And um, yes, for our YouTube channel or for any social media pages, you can find us by just keying in Aesthetic Medicine India and we would be right there. Uh, Dr. Raj, are we ready? Shreel, it's still, um, it's still not completely working on my side. I'm really, really sorry. Um, is, is there anything you can do in terms of the panel stuff beforehand and come back to me? Is that possible at yes. all? Yes, so uh, maybe then we move on to our panel discussion and uh, I come back to you uh, for your presentation. I'll, I'll get it ready for you, boss. It's all ready anyway. Apologies. Okay, perfect. No problem at all. So, uh, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to our fifth session but i can't call it the last session for today because uh, we would come back to uh, dr raj for his insights as well so our fifth session for today uh, which is now the fourth is a panel discussion on the... starting starting yes request all the panelists to uh, keep yourselves on mute thank you so much and our fifth session for today is a panel discussion on procedural options in management of melasma and hyperpigmentation and indian perspective i would now like to welcome the session moderator and panelist uh, with a brief introduction please welcome our session moderator dr pratim goel medical director and founder cute skin solution mumbai with 20 years of experience, Dr. Apratim Goel is a trainer as well as a pioneer in various lasers, derma roller, botulinum toxin, and fillers in India. Her specialization includes dermatology with special interest in lasers, threads, medispa, and injectables. To be up to date on the new technologies for skincare, she has been attending extensive training courses on various lasers, thread lifts, mesotherapy, botulinum toxin fillers, and other cosmetic procedures at prestigious institutions globally. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Apratim. Introducing and welcoming our panelists who will be joining Dr. Apratim for this discussion. Please welcome Dr. Jagdish Sakya, Director Sakya Skin Clinic, Mumbai. Dr. Jagdish Sakya is the General Secretary of Gujarat State Branch of Dermatology, President of Pigmentary Disorders Society of India, and an Executive Committee Member of the Cosmetology Dermatology Society of India, among several others. Dr. Chiranjeev Chabra, Dermatologist and Director-in-Chief, Alive Wellness Clinic. Dr. Chiranjeev Chabra's areas of interest include lasers, anti-aging medicine, pigmentary disorders, treating vascular lesions, acne, botulinum toxin, and fillers. She is a founder member of Indian Association of Aesthetic Laser Surgeons, International Society of Laser Surgery and Medicine, and American Society for Laser Medicine and Surgery. Dr. Rajesh Nair, Founder, Skin Care Specialty Center, Tiruvananthapuram. Drawing on more than 20 years of experience practicing the art of cosmetology, Dr. Rajesh Nair is a super specialist in the field. Through his clinic in Tiruvananthapuram, he offers an array of treatments from facial and body contouring procedures to botulinum toxin lasers, peels, hair restoration, face lifts, liquid fillers, and more. And Dr. Falguni Shah, dermatologist, cosmetologist, and founder of Radiant Skin Clinic, Mumbai. Dr. Falguni Shah has received training from leading dermatologist and cosmetologist of Australia, Singapore, the US, Thailand, and Hong Kong. She is a pioneer in giving non-surgical rejuvenation of neck and facial contouring and using latest techniques in the field of botulinum toxin, fillers, mesotherapy, and lasers. Thank you all the panelists for joining us today. I now request Dr. Apratim to take the discussion further. We have 45 minutes for the discussion and uh, we look forward to an interesting one. Thank you, Shreyal, uh, and welcome everyone. I think Dr. Sakya hasn't yet joined. Looks like Shreya. Yes. So probably you could call uh, him Dr. in the meantime. Sakya will just join us shortly, Dr. All right. So I'll start. So, well, uh, my panelists have been introduced and um, I'll start with the presentation. So though originally the presentation was, can, uh, can uh, is my screen seen, uh, Shreya? Yes, it is visible. You okay. could just go. Go to the slideshow uh, slide yes. mode and start from there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, originally the presentation was uh, just melasma, but I have included hyperpigmentation also in this. So, uh, you know, let's start uh, because we have a lot to catch up with. So, all the doctors who are here in this webinar today, we all know that the biggest challenge to a practice in India is handling pigmentation. 
the reason being pigmentation is not just one diagnosis it can occur as pih perioral hyperpigmentation periorbital post acne melasma freckles and myelodosis and a long list and then to top it all we have multiple indications in the same patient and plus everybody wants to become fair which is a general obsession so let's discuss how to handle this monster in our practice effectively and also i would request my panelists to please give their honest opinion just your experience not they don't have to be necessarily supported by you know a textbook chapter or a paper i would like to hear practically how do you handle these cases in your practice uh, so let's speak the truth of course if i feel or you know i may chip in my opinion as well though i am a moderator you could pass the question if you feel it's a repeat and uh, also let's get going so why is it so tricky to treat hyperpigmentation because it has a varied presentation as i said it has a mixed picture and uh, the patient doesn't understand your diagnosis and treatment all they understand is that they are psychologically disturbed by the pigmentation it can appear something like this which is perioral pigmentation it could appear something like this which is post acne again a varied presentation or melasma so because of multiple etiology the melanin being in various uh, you know parts of skin uh, monotherapy not working very well um, though i have missed a few earlier lectures by other presenters treatment options many confusing and lot of new drugs in the market lot of technologies uh, so there is no universal treatment guideline which works on every patient and as i said it's a cosmetically distressing problem so since uh, while dr sakhia joins in i will uh, you know move on to my next panelist uh, dr chiranjeev so uh, dr chiranjeev i would like to know that in your practice uh, let's stick to melasma right now in your practice which is the uh, which are the top two treatments of your choice which Uh, you know, given a patient comes for melasma, which you choose because you know you've been working with practically every technology in the world in your setup and for a long time. Now, since uh, thank you, Abratim, and uh, a very good evening, uh, co-panelists. Uh, I uh, loved what Abratim said. That be honest. so in my practice uh, we have a group practice and we have multiple clinics and to share with you i do not use chemical peels personally for melasma okay so my other my associate doctors use but i have a bent towards technologies for treating melasma so what information i will share with you is pure information without the use of chemical peels so when i'm pushed against the wall that i do not have chemical peels with me and i still have to give results with technology so i try my very best uh, to give the better results and find the uh, best combinations my best combinations are lasers and hyaluronic acid skin boosters in the form of a mesotherapy that i'm doing for treating melasma these days uh, initially till about 5 years back or till about for three years back also i was using just a combination of different lasers which were ablative semi ablative non ablative but now since the past three years i've combined them with skin boosters and i find that my results wherever they had got stuck have started improving so you are saying that um, you know you use laser technology which is uh, what q switch laser chiranjeev i use a pratim a combination of q switch laser ndr long pulse laser as well as the fractional laser these three lasers for the past 6 years i have done extensive work with this combination and before uh, past 5 6 years i was using a combination of q switch long pulse ndr and along with uh, fractional non ablative 1440 15 50 wavelengths so so you do them in the same session achiran ji uh, yes so so could you tell us your order of uh, laser i'm doing it so i would if i do them in the same session like it all depends if i have the uh, privilege or if i have the liberty i will do all three together that is i will have and first i will do ndr long pulsed then i will do q switch laser and lastly i will do erbium fractional laser in that uh, that uh, order okay and then you put the filler 
you what you are saying hyaluronic acid i normally call them in a se separate session once the skin has healed and the exfoliation has happened and the erythema edema inflammation has subsided to a certain degree maybe after 2 3 weeks i will call them for a skin booster but, but you do as a separate process skin separate, booster yes. and the skin booster you give only in the melasma patch chiranjeev because we are talking about melasma here uh, apratim i started doing skin booster how i stumbled on uh, is that i was doing skin booster for the full face and i realized that my same patients who were having melasma they started improving in the melasma patches so wow. that why i discovered that maybe something is helping and uh, in fact before i came for this session i asked my associate doctors i said i want your independent advice if you are chiranjeev shabra and you have to give this answer which apratim is going to put forward to me what will you answer hmm. so apparently two of them had very similar is answers i mean the skin boosters and a combination of lasers so i now what i've started doing is if i have to treat melasma and if i have limited if i have have limited booster to use then i go at least 1 inch in around the melasma patch okay so then you probably will not be using the entire syringe of 1 ml so if i have i will use the entire syringe of 1 ml so normally mm -hmm. i use 2 ml 1 ml on each cheek Oh, okay. So, okay. but uh, Chiranjeev, my question is: You repeat the technology monthly, right? Yes. But the boosters also you repeat monthly, like yes. every, okay. If if you if I go according to the protocol which I have made in my studies, then I will be using a booster every month for three months. But invariably, some people don't come. Most people don't come every month. They will come in two months or three months. But I'm finding that in spite of that, also the thing the combination is working. Uh, could you please tell us what which booster are you using, Chiranjeev? Because I'm sure I'm going to get that question later on. So I started this with Restylin Vital. Okay. And I started seeing good results, and now I've also used. Then I even used Bolitero Hydro, with which I have found excellent results. Actually, I started with Bolitero Hydro. Then okay. I this product went out of the country, so I will shift yes. to Vital. And now I use Vital or Volite, both of them. But Chiranjeev, I have a question. Vital, uh, sorry, Volite, uh, sometimes tends to just clump and stay as a nodules under the skin. Yes. So do you, but I'm giving on cheek and having a prominent, uh, you know, kind of a papular bites all over the cheeks. Won't they bother? So uh, if you ask me truthfully, I give deep, either very deep dermal or subcutaneous. Okay. All right. Lovely. Thank you so much. And Chiranji will stay with you. So the favorite combination now I understand, which almost always works, is that you do uh, these three uh, laser technologies, and two weeks later you follow them with a filler, no, uh, yes. cross link yes, or no, yeah. of skin booster. The brands don't want to call it a filler; they call it a skin booster. Skin booster. Yes, yes, I understand. Okay. Now, uh, Chiranji, with your vast experience on melasma management, what do you think is missing in melasma still? in terms of procedural and technological management is there anything you feel you still wish you had it yes um apratim i even uh, was working i find that melasma is basically inflammation okay and inflammation induced by anything it could be many reasons i won't get into that but basically okay. end result is inflammation converting into pigmentation and so we need a tool which will very very objectively reduce the inflammation uh vascular why not steroid yes steroid but then patients get used to using hmm. steroid over a long period of time okay and yes we have vascular lasers but they are reducing the outcome of inflammation they are not reducing the inflammation itself mm -hmm. so, so we need some good molecules we need good some something which is really good which the patient doesn't get addicted to got it got it okay now staying on sorry ha huh. among the technologies for melasma because you know i call you like a queen of technologies in india now among the technologies for melasma chiranjeev which is the one which has disappointed you with inconsistent results i i just need honest you don't have to name the brand just say the technology no, no, I, i will tell you i will tell you everything okay um, and um, See, uh, melasma. I actually started using the Q switched NDIAG laser mm -hmm. alone. Okay, so alone Q switched NDIAG laser disappointed me. 
and lot of us are using only cusage and diaglaza yeah it disappointed me so that is okay. why i was forced to combine it with i thought that what is it that i'm dealing with what is this what is this monster that i'm dealing with that mm -hmm. i try to heal it and it runs ahead of me so mm -hmm. i thought of inflammation and what i did is i combined with ndag 1064 India one zero six four is not attacking the intracellular pigmentation. It is working on the extracellular, intercellular pigmentation. Mm -hmm. So means it is working on the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So that out of the way. Then Q switch NDAG is working on the intracellular pigmentation. So when I was using just Q switch alone, I found that I got limited because I could not use it beyond seven eight sessions. Otherwise, it was producing uh, those uh, whitish spots, or you know, those hypopig hypopigmentation. So it was. I was. I was uh, obstructed from going ahead. So when mm. I combined it, but I'm not obstructed. If you use NDA long pass laser, you are not obstructed. You can go a long way. A BM fractional not obstructed. Lovely. Then Lovely. I use even if I'm using call, calling them once in a month, mm -hmm. I stop doing Q switch laser after six to eight months. But I can still continue with the other two modalities. fantastic as long as i need to maintain the patient fantastic and uh, you've answered my next question that is if peel then which one do you prefer you said you do you don't do peels for melasma okay. no i mean i'm being honest the world has peels i don't do peels my hands are tied so i have to work with the tools i have to work with Oh, that, that's very nicely put. Thank you, Chiranjit. So now let's stay on the topic of melasma. Dr. Rajesh, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Hi. All right. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Apatha. Hi. hi, Dr. Rajesh. I want to know which are your top two treatment choices for melasma. Okay, that is a difficult choice because there is a basket of uh, treatment available. So according to me, it depends upon the uh, melasma also. So if I get a patient with a patchy melasma or a spots, a few spots, I will go for a spot TCA peel, and then uh, that that should be like uh, once in two weeks for two or three sessions, spot mel TCA peel with about twenty uh, to twenty five percent uh, TCA peel, and then followed okay. with. Q switch and diagnosis uh, laser multiple sessions. That will be my protocol for the uh, patchy lesions. And if I get a patient with the extensive lesions involving large part of the uh, face, I don't use TCA. I go with only the lasers. Lasers first. I use a uh, erbium yag laser. That is basically when you use a erbium yag laser. See, there is a textural improvement and there is a improvement in the epidermal melasma. And then okay. followed with the um, Q switch and DR glazes. This is what I generally follow. The okay, all right, and uh, yeah, which is your favorite combination? Which almost always works. I said almost because we know it's not certain. Yeah, yeah, that is what it doesn't always because individual variations is there. Some one patient sure. comes with this uh, one uh, one protocol, you use it, and the other one it doesn't work. at all in the other patients so it is right. an individual variations what we see in melasma it doesn't right. work in all the cases process or what we have so yes. uh, my favorite combination will be a trichloroacetic acid peel and qcd and dia glaze okay. my favorite combination and you don't do them in the same session no i don't do i follow okay. it uh, the initial uh, tca peel so that the little peeling is there see actually these patients are frustrated they they want hmm. uh, results see they can't yeah. wait for uh, keep on coming back and doing it again again true, true, true. I, uh, tca peel works well they get a lightening so they are happy and what then, percentage uh, of tca did you mention uh, i i use 20% 20 okay all right and coming to male melasma do you see any difference in the uh, response to treatment in males Yeah, uh, male melasma is generally very difficult to treat. Uh, okay. Probably because these uh, males they don't follow our protocol. They don't come back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they just they come for two or three sessions and then they disappear. And generally, what we see is they are more exposed to UV radiation. They don't apply the topical creams what we apply. And generally, okay. they are these are melasma which is very stubborn, very thick. So it's very okay. difficult to treat. Uh, so generally, I use I don't use TCA much on them because uh, see, photo protection will be a problem for me. So I directly go for uh, either a BM Yag laser or Q switch. Q switch. Okay. And is there any technology which, uh, like we I asked same question to Chiranjeev also, which has disappointed you, which you thought would work but didn't work? Yeah. You switched in the act. Oh my God! In that uh, that fight. Okay, we do something, but say, see, see, 
that that is the one thing which okay in, Okay. Okay. Any experience with Pico, Doctor Rajesh? Pico laser? No, I do, I don't have. I know okay. experience with Pico. Okay. Okay. Now let's, uh, Doctor Falguni, you are there? Yes. Yes, I'm there. Hi. Hi, Falguni. Hi. Hi. Uh, what is your uh, top treatment choices when uh, a melasma walks in? Uh, so I resonate almost what Chiranjeev said that my top choice is actually uh, a Q switch uh, laser with the especially the one with the PTP mode. because that way i'm able to take care of you know distribute the energy a bit and with uh, an intradermal hyaluronic acid but so you uh, do it in the you, same session i do it in the same session so that is a little bit different that i did from chiranjeev that uh, i will do the q switch and then do the um, intradermal hyaluronic acid but i don't use the cross link at all so okay. i stick only to non cross link because i feel the idea is to give hydration so when i'm giving intradermal i I'm able to uh, place, but if I'm giving uh, um, a cross-linked one, I may have to go a little bit deeper, which I may have to go um, subcutaneous. So something okay. like a Restylane Vital, and I agree, uh, the Hydro was very good by Polyfero, but uh, it's not there anymore. And then there was always also one called that Skin Whisk or something, which was from Geosmatic. I used to which use that also, also but that there. is also not available anymore. So right. you switch so do and you, uh, do you dilute the HA or you just inject the way it comes in the syringe, Palguni? Hello. Uh, Doctor Falguni, you are on mute. You will have to just unmute. Hello. Yeah, now can yes. you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Can hear you. So, do so, you dilute yeah. the filler or just use the way it comes? No, the um, the non-crosslink ones I use just the way it comes. So I okay. don't dilute it. Okay. Now, um, uh, which is that? Is this the combination which almost always works? So this is the by... combination. If there is diffuse pigmentation and not really a, a concentrated patch of melasma, this is what gives me because the overall appearance of because see the patient is not here to uh, for us to clinically uh, give them breakups. So that this is the kind of melasma you of have, course, and this is course. what you don't have. So if it's diffuse and all over the face, then I will go with this combination. But otherwise, I do use peels also, especially the ones with the uh, yes, we'll come to peels. And... We'll come to peels. Yeah. So among so the treatments of melasma, which uh, which is the one which has disappointed you, um, you're not happy with, and you kind of give up using in your practice. Anything? Um. So PRP, I it's not a laser, but mm -hmm. people were you know the PRP was a big thing around. But mm -hmm. I somehow was very disappointed. In fact, in a couple of patients, I also. thought that it came back a little bit more aggressively maybe due to the trauma mm -hmm. or whatever trauma. but i wasn't i wasn't happy with prp so that's uh, something i gave up can i just get dr chiranjeev where dr chiranjeev are you around yes hi chiranjeev what is your take on prp for melasma uh apratim i have done uh, prp i mean i do a lot of prp for general facial rejuvenation okay so i did not notice any improvement in my melasma patients Yeah. Okay. Okay. But then I was thinking about it. Is it the quality of the PRP that I'm using? Because I'm mm. using these commercial tubes, and uh, I won't name which ones, but commercial tubes. So maybe the concentration of the PRP yes. is different, or maybe yeah. it's better quality, more PRP. Yeah. I don't. Know. If somebody has an experience of what they're using and finding results. I could. As Doctor Sakhya joined us here. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Doctor Pratim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Doctor Sakhya, your experience on PRP for melasma. Yeah. I think the, it's, uh, I have studied one article. It's published by I think our own dermatologist, Dr. Madhuri Agrawal and her team. Okay. It's a GFC, not the PRP. It's a concentrated uh, modified PRP. Growth factor. So, growth factor. So we yes. use uh, like this. Last one year we are using this like load, and okay. almost it's a product. Each and every patient uh, in the lesional in intra lesional injection with Q switch okay. and the laser. It's always combination, not a solo therapy. PRP. I think we need some trauma to uh -huh. stimulate to work. Neurotic is there. This collagen fiber will stimulate the platelet, but uh, practically in experience we need something like Q switch or any IPL or like RBM glass or mm -hmm. low power flexible uh, CO2 laser, and with PRP give excellent result. So I think with the uh, help of PRP and QC, this is my top because you missed. I missed the initial slide uh, in the okay. presentation. Yes. My, yes. Two, uh, my two uh, this uh, top most uh, treatment uh, in my melasma management is QC and the laser and the uh, this PRP. This uh, in the, the same GFC. session, Doctor Sakya. 
In the same only same cell. Only same cell. First, do hmm. Kiss Switch and DR laser, and hmm. last, uh, PRP. But okay. age Doppler challenge, heart challenge, the uh, cross link uh, uh, hyaluronic acid injection also give worth. Because in majority patient, patient has already used something like a triple combination. So already hmm. skin is inflamed, little bit damaged. There is a elastic damage, photo damage. So this mm -hmm. non cross hyaluronic acid also repair this part also and prepare for the laser part also. So yes. cross link, so they are extre uh, expensive molecule. So I suggest uh, if you don't want to invest or patient don't want to invest, there is a ready-made available cocktail. Mizo cocktail is available like uh, Mizo Bright or Mizo Hylu. They are very less, means uh, 600 rupees per ml. So you can try instead of this uh, white vital and the costing by I think more than 10, 12,000 rupees. Uh, the uh, Dr. Sakya, this uh, Mizo Hyal, the, is this a viscous solution like a uh, HA, like how we have our uh, Yes, it's a, it's a viscous solution, viscous oh, solution, excellent. but it's, it's totally non-cross. Vital and this is a partially cross link. Uh -huh. So the effect will last for a little bit longer in, in comparison to this uh, uh, pure non-cross link iron acid. This is also 1%. So, oh, okay. Uh, Mizo Hyal, you said, no? Mizo Hyal. Mizo Hyal. It's, it's a Korean company, Mizo Hyal and Mizo Bright. These are okay. uh, readily available in the market. So many distributed in India. So I think we are, and also in few patients, we are combining tranexamic acid and Mizo Bright in combination, 0.5 cc, 0.5 cc each. Okay. Okay. That's and forget IPL also, we are using IPL extensively because IPL is a forgotten uh, devices. But if you're yes. good IPL, then as you, you all know, the vascular component is always there. If you're mm -hmm. using 585 filter for the good IPL, then also give excellent result. So always in my practice, either we are using IPL with lactipil or we are using Q-switch, lactipil, and this uh, PRP, this is a GFC. So these are two best combinations we are using in my practice. Okay. And uh, Dr. Falguni, are you using peels for melasma? I do use the ones with, uh, so I have used the uh, Cosmolan, which most people must have used, especially, but when they had with hydroquinone, it was a better combination. <coughs> Without hydroquinone, it is not as great, okay. but okay. I do use it. I do use okay. it. Okay. So Dr. Rajesh, primarily he uses a lot of TCA. Dr. Sakya, your take on peels for uh, melasma? Because we are using devices. So always use, if you are using devices, then you always use gel-based peel. But if you're doing solo sorry, peel, Dr. Those, Sakya, what did you say? If you use devices? If you use uh -huh. with any devices statement like IPL, Frexor, or UQ suite, then always use gel-based peel like lactic peel ah, yeah. or RG peel. Yeah. Like. Okay. But if you are using solo peel like you can yes, Dr. Ajay said PCA is the wonderful peel for the initial phases, one mm -hmm. couple of two or three, then maintenance on either uh, glycolic or there is a ready-made pill. So many mela pill is coming with cocktail, yeah. citric, lactic, all in even five to six pills uh, in low concentration. Doctor Sakya, there is a pill called Meline pill, which is promoted yeah. specially for uh, anybody has experience on Meline for melasma. I have used it. Um, so they say that you use one session a month yeah. for around three months, and then there is a Meline mask also that yes. you can use yes. with that. So uh, I didn't see anything very um, hmm. crazy hmm. different from what the cocktail peels Dr. Sakia is talking about. Okay. So And uh, Falguni will stay with you. So when you have female patients, do you suggest them, see, because you are not going to treat them immediately, do you suggest that they conceal? And when you ask them to cover the patch with the makeup or a concealer, do you have a preferred brand? Short answer, please. Yeah, I use... Uh, if they can get afford and buy it, then the Fenty Beauty is a very good concealer brand mm -hmm. because okay. it is uh, it it it's not as thick, but it is well pigmented. So I okay. ask them to use that. Plus, they, it has the shades, which many shades that you can you know the purple concealer, the yes. brown concealer, the orange concealer, all of it. Lovely. So that's why so Fenty Beauty. All right. So uh, I would like to this to open to all the panelists. That do you think there is a role of We'll leave the oral out of it because I'm sure it's discussed already. Do you think there's a role of intravenous glutathione in mel melasma management? Yes or no? Dr. Sakia. I already <laughs> used in one patient only, patient using this triple combination for prolonged period and they came back with sudden tanning, full face tanning uh, okay. on the face. 
Uh -huh. Nothing will work because in such type of patient, you can't use Q switch or any pills. So then this patient, we use IV glutathione 12 session once a week and we, we found excellent result. This is only one patient I got good okay. result. Love so it. patient selection is very important. Okay. Uh, Falguni, any role of glutathione in your practice in melasma? In melasma? It makes them look good and uh, it, it makes them feel brighter. So it's not in melasma, but patient uh, compliance, well-being, yes. Okay. I mean, they, they feel Rajesh, good with it. Okay. Dr. Rajesh, any role of IV glutathione in your practice in melasma? Yeah, I don't think uh, IV glutathione helps in melasma, actually. But Achha. overall, the patient's uh, confidence and everything. Good, yeah. 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 Dr. Chiranjeev, <laughs> IV glutathione in your practice? The same thing. I agree with Rajesh that they feel good. They feel they're doing something. And overall, they feel yeah. better. But yeah. whether it's helping in melasma, I cannot comment on yeah. that. Okay. We'll stay with Chiranjeev. Chiranjeev, intralesion tranexamic acid. Do you inject tranexamic I think uh, Dr. Sakya mentioned he does. So do you also inject tranexamic acid into the lesion of melasma? Yes, I do inject tranexamic acid and uh, in very diluted dosages. Oh, and, diluted. Uh, so, yeah, very diluted dosage into the, into the lesion. Okay. And, but I have not made an objective analysis that if, if the improvement is due to tranexamic acid, how much and how much is due to the other combinations. Got it. Mm -hmm. So Chiranjeev, that was the whole idea of having this panel that we could have a study. Like, uh, you know, we still don't have a lot of, uh, it's just few cases, one person. So we were also thinking of enrolling into a group, uh, you know, which we can publish a paper, come up with a consensus. Yeah, we should, I think. Yeah. I started using tranexamic acid at least about 15, 18 years back after visiting wow. some other clinic abroad, mm -hmm. an Asian clinic. Mm -hmm. And that was what, st uh, at that time I never used uh, tranexamic acid. So that's the time I've been using, but I've, I don't, it's not a protocol that I have to use it in each and every patient. Got it. Any panelist has an experience on using those LED panel, any LED light panels in melasma? So not a solo, but with mm -hmm. the combination, if you are giving, a, I, I think, RBM glass or flexor CO2 laser, yes. it just reduce the inflammation and to prevent any PI. So not a okay. solo, it will not work okay. in the solo treatment right. with combination. So right. I have uh, used one of those LED, not the panels, but there was this handheld device which I got from one of the EADV conferences called Zero Gravity with LED lights. Mm -hmm. And it did help in reducing the inflammation overall. So between two sessions of my uh, Q-switch and uh, a combination of hyaluronic acid. I keep doing that. I do it regularly with patients. They mm. feel less inflamed and the, you know, the, the skin looks less angry. So I think it does help somewhere. Right. So we will be ending the discussion on melasma. I'm sorry, I'm kind of fast forwarding it, uh, Shriyal, because I have a lot to cover. So uh, is there anything which any other panelists would like to add in from their experience? Uh, I want to say something. I was never a big fan of IPL. Okay, because okay. I found it was inferior to the word laser. Yes, it is. <laughs> so of late, I started experimenting with IPL. And as uh, Sakya is saying that good quality IPL. So I found uh, of late that yes, IPL has a very good role. Okay. I just want to say a last word here. I don't know if it'll, any of you probably, uh, you know, Chiranjeev would have already tried it. Chiranjeev, I was reading a paper, a Korean paper on the use of haifu uh, mm. in melasma for the fact that there's a lot of solar elastosis and it helps. So, you know, I did try it in four patients and I got marvelous results. Yeah. Yeah, haifu on the patch, like, you know, just 30 to 40 shots over the melasma. So maybe, you know, we can, somebody we can, can try. Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. All right. So with this, you know, uh, the other questions from yes, audience. Sir. Apritam, yes, sir. One yes. minute. So uh -huh. just message to the audience, because always give sufficient time to the patient for the counseling in first session. Okay. If you don't give, if you start treatment in her then patient will take time each and every session same amount of time so always ask patient this is a basic treatment this is a combination treatment this is advanced treatment hmm. so start with the basic treatment you may see to the combination treatment and ask them this is a reserve treatment like advanced like a in, intralysis injection like a vital or you can combine so many things prp yes. so yes. like yes. this don't jump, jump with the directly combination or advanced treatment yes dr sakya 
got it okay now i've also put in some difficult cases because you know as indian doctors we know that the skins of our patients hyperpigmentation over the body over the face is very very common so we are moving out of melasma now and thank you so much my panelists it was it was one of the most beautiful discussion i have i've seen lately now coming to hyperpigmentation so i am back to uh, falguni chiranjeev all of you uh, do you give iv gluta when somebody says i am tanned Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I, I do. I don't. Yeah, even I do. Yeah. I do. So I everybody do. does IV gluta, including me. Yeah. Now, when we are dealing with tanning, uh, which is the peel? Which is best peel in your opinion? Which molecule? So I like doing a vitamin A uh, base peel with some arbutin, and uh, so it because the patient has a little bit of flaking also in two three days of skin. From tanning point of view, I think that works best for me. Okay, like and a yellow name, peel. Okay, a yellow peel kind of thing. Okay, okay, which is a cream and a liquid. The uh, a liquid uh, combination. Okay, uh, Chiranjeev, any uh, what is your erbium fractional peel? What is that fractional? Peel? A laser peel, erbium fractional. Peel. Acha, okay, the laser okay. peel. Okay, but you don't apply a chemical peel on top. I personally don't. Acha, Doctor Rajesh. So I'm. Yeah. Doctor Sakia, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm using lecti because I'm always using with the devices. So mm -hmm. gel, gel base, lecti or arginine. It means lecti eighty percent. I'm the only eighty percent of my patient. I'm using this lecti pill, and twenty percent okay. I'm using uh, this uh, retinol pill, yellow pill. Doctor Sakya, one thing which I one word which I admire a quality of yours is daring. You know, there are a lot of times I have listened to you. I have actually dared to go back and do that, and it has worked. So thank you so much, and you know you are so honest in sharing everything. Of course, all my panelists are today, uh, so I'm really enjoying it. So eighty percent lactic peel you are saying, uh, along yes. with the technology. Okay, Doctor yeah. Rajesh. Yeah, peel. I use the lactic and mandelic acid. It works well. Okay. These okay. two combinations I found to be very well gel based. I usually use the gel based, and it works. Okay. Now I have a very strange question starting with Doctor <laughs> Rajesh. What do you do for your skin? See, dermatologists are supposed to have a glowing skin. So, what is your one treatment, whether it is a laser or a peel or polishing? What? Yeah, what I say generally, I don't do anything. I don't get time, but I ask my staff to do it. But then, I am a fan of uh, Erbium glass laser. Ah, so it gives me yeah. a good rejuvenation, hmm. good tightening, and good thing. Erbium glass fifteen fifty works best for me. All right, right. Chiranjeev, your secret. My secret is. I'll tell you my latest secret. Means the latest wala batao. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. The latest skin secret is that I am doing the same combination. I I love India Long Pass Laser for skin rejuvenation. Okay. I am a fan of Erbium Fractional, but I do it less often. Mm -hmm. And I of late have started using. I'm I mean it's not a part of this subject, but I'm started using macadamia. I mean some topical agent for facial massage. So I do a macadamia nut and almond oil facial massage every day, and mm -hmm. I use these technologies. I won't. I'm not using it all the time, but say once. So I don't hear Q switch in uh, you. Uh, uh, isn't like North India the facial hair are like I am hairy. So uh, how would you get rid of the fine facial hair if you don't use Q switch? I don't have any longer. Kar kar. Acha. Acha acha. Okay. <laughs> Falguni, your secret. I I I do the combination of the carbon peeling and the uh, abital. I do it quite often on myself. Okay okay. I like that whole look. Which comes with that? Yeah, the little stretchy. I am stretchy. Uh, yes, okay. I am using radio frequency uh, RF uh, once or twice a year, and also once a year IFO. IFO. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, anything for frequency. lightening? Anything for lightening the skin, Doctor Sakya? It's automatic. If your skin is, Achha. I think, is good. I I put RF take care of the rest part. Always <laughs> right. True, true. <laughs> Doctor Sakya, your experience on Pico lasers. uh i think the price is a big factor otherwise a good mm -hmm. one not a, as per the price if, if we are comparing the price with qs and pico laser mm -hmm. definitely is a good one but not uh, i think i did not convince with the pico laser only in few uh, selected mm -hmm. case of tattoo mm -hmm. uh, multi color tattoo gave excellent result and also it reduced the number of session in uh, nevus of water otherwise okay. there is a no big difference it's as per my experience chiranjeev any experience on pico Yeah, Pico. I agree with Sakya that mm. Pico 
laser is popular in countries where tattoos are very common or very often. Hmm. So but for pigmentation, you are not very kicked about. Pigmentation, yeah, the money, in the financial aspect is restrictive. If you are running multiple clinics, you can't afford to have pico. Of course, in the clinic. yeah, true. So you can have just one pico maybe, and the rest of the clinics you do a regular Q switch laser. No, no, okay. So there's not too much of. A, I don't find too much of a difference. Got it, got it. Now, Chiranji will stay on you. You deal with the fair skins, uh, you know, more of. North Indian Punjabis. skins, the Punjabis, yes. So, you know, I think, you know, this is a phenomenon which is seen very commonly, uh, tanning, you know, the sleeve. So, uh, you know, when they come frustrated to you, what do you do? What do you tell them? That it will just go away or you do something about it? So, I never lose, I never tell them to lose hope. Okay. I actually make them very hopeful. Okay. And I actually tell them that I can help them. Mm -hmm. And I start on a good prescription. Mm -hmm. effective prescription with lot of cosmeceuticals okay also medical molecules but lot of cosmeceuticals and i call them very early i call them back within a week's time okay and then i start after week 10 days i start with some procedure and mostly my procedures starting procedures are lasers okay and then later on maybe i make a plan for them apratim okay. i actually am very honest mm -hmm. and i will Half, I will tell them in the first step, we'll do these two lasers. And the next step, we will add this. Third step, we will do this. We'll add skin boosters. So I tell them a whole gamut. In fact, sometimes I feel that we will run away. I don't know how many patients have come How many of my patients have come to you? No, no, no. They were very impressed by you. Actually, they taught me that, you know, a plan is needed. Uh, you know, actually, I, I admired that. They, they messaged me a prescription and said, you know, she was very thorough. Pura plan hai, pura saal ka. That, that was impressive, actually. We, that's, I something learned from you. That was great. So, so that means you tell them that tanning can be handled. And your first thing is you don't jump to a peel. You pick on your, your laser machines and that's what you do. Right? Yeah. First, I, first, I give them a prescription and I give them a good prescription. Achha. I think in such type of cases, this glutathin work excellent. If yes, they can have a of tanning, then uh -huh. IV or even oral or subliquid give excellent Achha. result for the long term planning. I start glutathion the first day they come, but oral glutathion. Okay. Okay. Dr. Rajesh, would you yeah. handle it differently? Yes, I'm, uh, me, I go for a 70% uh, for the body. I get 70% uh, glycolic acid peel in combination with IV glutathione. Works wonderful. Matlab ye, uh, fresh uh, uh, tanning, mein you will do a peel immediately? Yeah, okay. yeah. If, if they come after a week, not the uh -huh. second day or something. After one week, they, if they come, see, we get all of this uh, uh, after a shoot or wedding shoot, they come back with a peel. Excellent results. The tan goes in okay. about in a week's okay. time. And one glutathione. Okay. Palguni? So I uh, give a lot of oral um, ah, cosmeceuticals, that definitely. And then I give IV glutathione. I also mm -hmm. do just a zoom handpiece of the Q-switch, the first okay. session that they come. And I think okay. a combination of this works well. They always come back. Uh -huh. Okay. So Chiranji, you see, this is the mistake which I did. I got this nevus, uh, And I did aggressive 10 sessions of <laughs> Q-switch NDAG and produce a permanent depigmentation. So I put up this slide only to tell that, you know, now this is a blunder. It's a therapeutic blunder. And uh, there was no way I could later on treat the hypopigmentation. Yeah, this is a common complication if you're yes. doing only QCH India repeatedly. So yes. give some in between other technology also, or you can combine QCH and flexor pseudology in the same session. You can avoid this stuff. because I also did so many patients. Okay. And me, this is very resistant. In yes. the few patients, I did punch grafting, three millimeter punch grafting in oh. such type of patient for oh. permanent tattooing. I did. Yes. Hey, this. In this case, we did a yeah. permanent tattoo only later, but I couldn't just get the. Present, present. What was the time gap between two sessions? Every month. In yeah. between, few times two she gave. Small, yeah, to small sport size. And yes. two short duration. And high fluence. High fluence. High I fluence. went on. It was med light, and I went on and on and on. You know, every time because the immediate white thing it gives you that high, and the patient is also with you. So, so I, I, I made a. I also made a very big blunder, and after that, I learned a lot of lessons. Mm -hmm. There was this girl with a dark underarms, and she came, and uh, she was in a hurry, and once a month she would come. 
and what would happen is she would my technician she would even if i would give settings she would insist to the technician to increase it increase karo yeah. and increase karo increase karo and ultimately she landed up with such a horrible hypopigmentation in the underarms oh i've never seen in underarms hypopigmentation underarms and then yeah. uh, she, she did lot of stuff after that and she got after my life also yeah so oh is, what happens is when they come every month at that point of time the hypopigmentation is not there Ah, correct. It appears later. But Chiranjeev, now I have learned my lesson. First hypopigmentation, I will cancel Q switch for the rest of the life for that patient. No touching no, no. them. No, no, no. The, the, just listen. Because the Q switch India Glazer is meant for the melanin destruction, not for the melanin side. If you are using eight seven correct. millimeter spot size. Yes. If yes. you are using two or three millimeter spot size, it will destroy the melanin side, which are producing is, melanin. Permanent. So spot. Sport size, so don't worry. Give eight, eight, ten mm uh, sport size and one joules, one point four two joules. Don't worry. No yes, any sir. chances of hypo or deep yes. emitter, but don't use uh, small sports uh, okay. sport size. Yes, doc. So, uh, uh, doc, uh, another problem which we see is for especially girls getting married and young girls, dark knees and dark elbows. I just need a single single point uh, solution from all my panelists, Doctor Sakia. Yeah, here the twenty percent TCA work excellently. Uh, if you have laser, then fractal or RBM can help because here there is an epidermal thickening. So you need any ablative part, either laser okay. or TCA. Yeah. There is okay. a no dermal pigment. This is a fractal. Okay. So either you see TCA or seventy percent glycolic, or you can use the the QC. There is a no role of QC in such type of pigments. Either yeah. uh, fractal okay. CO two laser, RBM glass, or TCA. Okay, Doctor Chiranjee. Body parts, I prefer glycolic and mild salicylic combination. Com, the inner combination, both the peels. Yeah, but basically glycolic and topical salicylic acid. Acha, you give alpha topical beta salicylic. both. Hmm. Yeah, and, so you are using H A B H A. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, Doctor Rajesh. Yeah, for the elbows and knees, as Doctor Sakhya has said, Arbium um, Gliac, Arbium Gliac fraction, fractionated laser works very well. Because you get rid of the thickness of dead the skin oh, and okay. the dead skin. I, I don't skin. think erbium fraction works. You, you okay. go multiple passes. I don't you think. It... But uh, Chiranjee, will the skin not thin and the pigmentation, the darkening not appear less if we go on doing erbium? It's very keratotic, na. Erbium is very a uh, superficial laser. No, Achha. you combine it with topicals. Ha, huh, that then maybe is uh, possible. Then maybe that... only Chiranjee, only <laughs> topical is working. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you like the skin and then, then the Zarina like combination, urea or any kind of urea. lighting like ah. real, you can use this. In fact, there is a foot cream, a lot of foot creams. I asked my patient to use foot creams, and that works better. Yeah. Because yes. yeah, they contain urea lactic acid high concentration. So I normally tell on these thick areas to use those foot creams. Even on occlusion, this uh, once a week. Uh, This is thick skin. Once a week, occlusion clobetazol for one or two over. Then uh, use you can use this uh, foot cream. So in the few uh, selected patient, only occlusion for short contact period. Clobetazol. So clobetazol for two hours occlusion with the cellophane sheet. Remove it and then put the. And remove it and then this uh, foot cream. Wow. Okay. Lovely. That's a great tip. Okay, now we move on, uh, Doctor Falguni. Uh, you know we get this. Of course, we are not going to discuss obesity here or the role of uh, weight loss. But would you do something else also for this thick and keratotic dark neck pseudocanthosis? So for the neck, I have tried. I've done seventy percent glycolic, and it is it works well. Q switch doesn't work on this, and then I give them a urea lactic acid combination, the Zerina, as Doctor Sakhya was saying. As home care, and it has given decent result with, of course, giving them oral as does everything that you need to give, uh, okay. the Cantax and the oral other nutraceuticals that I give. But seventy percent glycolic I do on the neck. Okay, Doctor Chiranji, I do the same thing as Falguri does. But would you not use an ablative laser? I use that also, but in always the patients are not agreeable. They want to spend on their face, but yes, <laughs> neck, not on the neck. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Doctor Sakia. So here we fractal CO two laser, uh, uh -huh. low para, low fluence, high density. <laughs> so two or four joules and twenty, thirty, forty percent coverage is excellent, and followed by with uh, uh, any keratolytic cream. So Might then after CO two, 
after co2 how many days later should they start a keratolysis initially 5 6 days only a moisturizing cream then mm -hmm. they can start with keratolytic cream so you're not scared about pih with the such high no, no. Uh, low flows low flows 2 to 4 millijoules and high coverage 20 to 40% coverage okay, literally it okay. is called we can call it a laser peel okay okay with the, but laser peel not with erbium but with co2 co2 fraction co2 okay okay dr rajesh yeah i tried with the uh, lasers uh, co2 and erbium but it doesn't work it comes back and you do they, you mm. I, i don't get much improvement it's hmm. not the salicy salicylic acid peat first and then i use 70% glycolic that works much better according to my so opinion. always patient put on metformin in such a type of patient irrespective yeah. of etiology yes. okay yeah. yeah but it always okay. comes back whatever you do i think it comes back okay but it's yeah. like melasma yeah <laughs> 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 many other alternative <laughs> that it comes back after some time okay okay now i have a very okay so this was a okay this i'll skip sorry now this is a very important thing because a lot of patients men mm -hmm. and women girls and boys they come for genital whitening uh, so it's a very common demand and i would like to use the my panels uh, you know right now with me to learn from them so um, you know genital whitening and then it's not just limited to females uh, you know um, it's anal bleaching uh, vaginal bleaching uh, penis bleaching scrotal lightening vaginal whitening nipple bleaching um, so uh, you know sometimes what happens is the patient would tell your staff uh, you know in confidence or maybe they share i don't know but i see a lot of demand and i am sure that uh, you know the uh, people who are associated here would also so my questions to all the panelists are that do you get any demands for uh, genital skin lightening in your practice dr sakya because uh, surat is near to mumbai so there are so many <laughs> patient right now since last one year uh -huh. couple of uh -huh. patient demanding for this uh, genital whitening and we are doing a peeling right now we are doing only peeling and qs with gendia laser together and gives okay. satisfaction not okay. it's the ultimate result but satisfaction result um, and is, though always you ask them this is a temporary you need a maintenance therapy and a topical cream also so it's not extensive or excellent result in genital lightening uh, till date but there is a improvement definite so a q switch followed by which peel and is it in the same session yeah same session same session also oh, which Because peel doc the combination will four is a like mela peel is already marketing available ah, like polyx yeah. salicylic yeah, yeah, citric yeah. acid and uh, there is a one four peels okay. in a same bottle okay and this is not a gel peel i understand is it no they, not gel peel we need require a little bit aggressive on the face okay. we are using gel peel but genital little bit aggressive peel but dr sakya when we talk of genitals you know there's a difference in female genitalia and male genitalia yes. so uh, the always the question comes female is still okay because the skin is much thicker and they land up doing laser hair removal so that time lightening becomes okay but in a male genitals uh, is this what you would do also what you are saying over But the scrotal not single men came for this treatment <laughs> only always came no. female <laughs> so we need to create an awareness campaign <laughs> Okay, very true, very true. Dr. Rajesh, you also didn't get a single name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody okay. Came to okay. No, but uh, okay. Chiranjeev no, no. and uh, Falguni did anybody? So actually, even for me, I have more of female genital lightening patients. More that I mean, males. I'm really not had many. Achha. I don't have any uh, experience to share. I had one patient, and we simply because we were also not sure now what to do mm -hmm. because he was asking. So we did thirty-five percent glycolic acid peel, and we sent him. He did four sessions, yeah. and I think he never came back. So <laughs> I don't know. Chiranji. So I, yeah, I get a lot of patients, female patients. I get no male patients. Or uh, maybe oh, if I am I doing something patient, wrong in my practice, <laughs> or something right <laughs> in your practice? I'm encouraging them to start coming, but yeah. as of now. <laughs> no, actually see this is something serious which we have to think that uh, you know the skin is very uh, uh, it is in folds it is so even laser hair removal for male genitals becomes a challenge i personally because we have a male guy who does for males especially the genital part but even the shaving becomes a challenge and then the whitening further becomes a challenge 
so uh, it's difficult but anyways okay so you all discuss what is your modus operandi uh, dr pratim we'll have yes. to conclude i have 5 minutes isn't it yeah, <laughs> okay okay so okay fine i think i'm i'm kind of in the end so yes so now if uh, uh, dr chiranjit if you have a female who has either bikini or underarms which is dark like jet black dark and on top of that has thick hair but comes to you for hair removal mm. what would you do do hair removal only or do skin lightening see first if she's come for hair removal first i will do hair removal okay and first means in the first session that same session okay and she uh, asked me for hair removal that is what she wants so i have to sort of deliver her that okay i can't say okay now i th think that is dark so we'll start with pigmentation first but okay. anyway even if i had the option i would still do hair removal first and maybe okay. after about two sessions or three sessions of hair removal because i find that i'm using ndr long pulse laser as well as the other in motion lasers i find somehow that with hair removal laser also some kind of lightening starts happening yes yes after maybe because hair removal. reduces so the depot of uh, pigment they start finding it lighter so they plus i think the ndr laser also works on lightening the skin to some degree okay. so after visits i will start the pigmentation laser and i maybe the patient starts seeing faster results till that time i'll put her on topicals okay everybody else agrees here with yes yes, yes. Exactly. yes absolutely we always use uh, in motion technology for the darker yeah. skin so laser actually will lighten the skin lighten so the your, skin it will be very easy so yes. initially low power and multiple repetition and one or two session then you can give optimum parameter so first okay one or two session low power but multiple passes got it got it because i think yeah. before, uh, before when we used to use the diode laser the light shear it used to burn a lot but now yes. the in motion yes. technology in motion it does yeah nobody gets a burns and the there's a significant lightning what we can see yes all right so thank you so much panelist and it was a lovely discussion so we've used uh, you know uh, our modalities for treating hyperpigmentation and melasma have been chemical peels the variety of lasers you've heard or laser uh, light based devices mesotherapy prp um, you know fillers rather um, what is skin boosters micropigmentation combination and makeup camouflage um, okay so the con in conclusion the in Okay, I think I can skip that. Thank you so uh, much. So many question is in the chat box. I think we okay. are missing the question. Let's take that. <laughs> Let's take that. Yeah. So now, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, uh, yes, actually, Doctor Pratim, what I'll suggest is go to the Q and A box. You may see there are some points you all have already covered. Maybe you want to just pick the best uh, two, three questions, the most relevant okay. ones that you all can okay. answer right now. Okay. Okay. And look at it from the end. Don't look at it from the start. because there were the other session questions too oh okay oh, ah, what is the name of the concealer somebody has i think uh, falguni said fenty beauty can intralesional tranexamic acid be used in the same session as prp i think dr sakhya can answer this yes okay. yes same session yes, yes same yes. session Okay, so somebody has a direct question to Dr. Chiranjee. What is the secret of her glowing skin? She just said that she is rubbing oils on her skin. Uh, <laughs> okay, oral glutathione. No, no, no. Good. I am doing long pulse NDR, herbium yes. fraction, and daily massaging my face. Yes, and uh, yeah, uh, this Mizo Bright and Mizo Hilo. Uh, any anyone uses combination of Q switch followed by low power fraction laser? Yes, I think. Uh, Doctor Sakhya yes, said. Yes, I am using. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. I am using almost each and every patient. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now somebody said, if inflammation, if if it is inflammation, what test do you use to added inflammation? CRP, any other inflammatory markers? Have you tried intralesional injection of steroids? I think Doctor Chiranjeev ke liye hai ye question about melasma. I think. Yeah. CRP is a is a is a low inflammation. You cannot detect with the test. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I think LED lights. We discussed Camilla. Um, yeah. That uh, just additional uh, to reduce the inflammation. And uh, please and uh, elaborate on skin boosters. I think uh, Mahima, you can get in touch with Dr. Shiranjeev. She has a vast experience on uh, that. Okay. Somebody said which is better, tablet S glutathione or L glutathione? 
डॉक्टर सखिया सर आई एम यूजिंग एल ग्लूटाथ एल ग्लूटाथ आई थिंक मोस्ट ऑफ अस सो आई थिंक वी हैव कवर्ड मोस्ट ऑफ द क्वेश्चंस ऑफ आवर सेशन thank you thank yeah. you so much <laughs> i you know thank you everyone all my panelists because i have really grilled you guys but i was myself enjoying yeah, and yeah, sometimes yeah. it was good to be a moderator <laughs> pratim i have attended so many times you are the moderator and you are the best moderator you are very honest you are very bold and you have no bars like you know you can go <laughs> Thank you so much, Chiranji. Yes, yes, Chiranji, but I really loved your input, sir, about technology. Because you know, my love is not really injectable; it's more of technology, and I love. Thank you so much, and I'm sure everybody who has attended this. Are you recording this, Shreyal, and putting it up? So we are recording the session, and we will share it on our YouTube channel and reach the links out to everyone. So we, I am going to watch this again because so much of knowledge, Dr. Sakya. Thank you, uh, Dr. Falguni. I know you have to rush for. Uh, the rakhi party but i have released you at 8:30 as i promised dr rajesh thank you so much thank yes, you thank so you. on that note thank you dr apratim goel for leading this discussion and our entire panel dr falguni shah dr jagdish sakhya dr rajesh nair and dr chiranjeev chabra for this yes. absolutely interesting and informative discussion i think i enjoyed the questions as well as the answers that came along and uh, for our last session inviting dr raj tethi founder of yorkshire skin center from the uk once again to share an international perspective on procedural options in melasma management he will be sharing a global perspective on procedural options in melasma management and uh, requesting raj uh, dr raj to take the session forward uh, you would have 15 minutes for this session dr raj uh, and over to you uh, you could check if you able to share your ppt now else i could do it from my end i will definitely try thank you so much guys that was so so informative and and from a uk perspective it's really interesting to see what people are doing you know locally in india i think it's very very interesting because we've got a very big mix of ethnic um patients in the UK um so i think i'll definitely be taking on some of those pointers and using them in my own practice um i'm going to try and share my screen now just give me one second maybe this yes. hopefully will work this time um can you see oh that's perfect yes you just need to go on the slide show mode oh, and slide show mode and there we go is that working there you go yes Fantastic, okay. fantastic. Sorry for the minor hiccup earlier. So, um, so my name is Dr. Raj. I am an aesthetic physician based in the UK. Um, I my background. Thank you so much for the amazing introduction previously, Shreya. But uh, I'm a trainer for two dermal companies, for Tioxin and Sinclair Pharma, and I'm also on the national editorial board for um, your kind of sister co corporation. So. Uh, instead of am india uh, we've got uh, aesthetic medicine in the uk um so i'm i'm on the editorial board for such and I, i write several pieces for them and help them with some of their editorials um also got a separate degree in advanced anatomy and we've got a multi award winning clinic that i'm really really proud of that we've made in uh, yorkshire which is in the north of england um that's my um instagram handle if anybody wants to send me a message or ask any questions at all you're more than welcome uh, and i think i've just while i've been listening to all of your pearls of wisdom i've been following all of you so please be aware uh, that you will see my will see my followers very soon I'm going to be talking about the procedural elements with regards to treatment of melasma. A lot of that stuff has already been covered, uh, and I don't want to bore you guys because obviously you're very, very highly tuned experts. We've got a lot of viewers still, and some people will know more than others. So I think it's just if we took it down back to basics just for a second, we know about the epidermal layers. We know that the melanocytes are living deep on that stratum basale layer, and we've got these dendritic arms that are feeding through those keratinocytes and giving our melanosomes and and, and depositing that pigmentation uh, into into and in about the different um keratinocytic layers we know about normal melanocyte function and then we've also got um overproduction and, and the uneven distribution of melanin and the main key factor and different differentiating factor is the distribution so we know that we've more we've got more of a horizontal um distribution when it comes to normal pigmentation with normal 
skin tone. Um, and sometimes when we have dysfunctional melanocytes, we start to get this towering effect and we start to get an input, uh, a buildup of both epidermal and then eventually, like we've already covered, sometimes dermal pigmentation also. This is um, very, very common in the UK. We get loads of different ethnic backgrounds and loads of different people coming into my clinic. Some people are obviously Caucasian. I've got kind of whole range of skin types coming in. We do see, being an Indian doctor in the UK, I do tend to see a lot of South Asian patients as well. So um, as I said, I'll definitely be taking on some of your, your pointers on board. When it comes to treatments for these conditions, we've got obviously loads of different things that we can throw at, and you guys have um, been through the whole list and, and it shared your wealth of experience, which is really, really refreshing to hear. And, and sometimes hearing the honest truth from, um, from colleagues is, is really refreshing because we always hear the lines from the companies and we know what they say and, and what they promise, but hearing refreshing things from colleagues saying things that do and do not work is, is really, really uh, reassuring. Uh, we do a whole host of different treatments in my clinic. I'm just going to be talking about some of my experience, but then also some of the um, some experiences you guys have a lot more than I have in, in the UK. Um, it'd be interesting to hear uh, if you guys do anything differently. So um, tranexamic acid has already been covered significantly. We've uh, throughout the, the whole of the uh, series of lectures, there's obviously different ways of uh, being able to administer it, including tridermal. Um, we're using a lot of oral tranexamic acid at the moment, and we're not using that much topical. Um, and similar to what was said earlier, we know that there's um, probably about six months of, of kind of maximum usage before we start to see things in slight decline or they start to plateau. And there's no longer term safe studies to show the safety and efficacy of transamic acid in my, in it, as far as I've seen, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected. Intradermally, we also are occasionally injecting it, but I think we've seen better results with oral. And this is just one of my, I'd like to just show a few cases. This is one of my patients who we've done um, a combination of treatments, but tranexamic acid, uh, orally was one of the key features here. We see an improvement in the facial melasma. She's South Asian, uh, she's kind of Indian in origin um, and based in the UK. We, and she's had melasma for many, many years. We can see there's been improvement in the overall skin tone. We've also used hydroquinone and tretinoin in this in the background previously, but she's had recurrent and quite resistant melasma that keeps coming back and keeps re rebounding. Um, but I thought the transamic acid actually had a really big impact in the way that it affected um, the longevity of my result, which was, which was fantastic in my experience. Um, We've heard from the Philippines, and we've heard from you guys having your experience with PRP. I think there's a mixed batch, a mixed experience of what people find in terms of the, the, um, the different types of PRP, the quality of the PRP. A lot of PRP quality is down to the, as, as right you mentioned, down to the tubes, down to the different specific um, components within the uh, longer term preservatives uh, in the citrates. Things will be changing and manipulating the way that these long term, um, long term will affect the, the the melasma and the way that it unfolds. I, I think in my personal experience, we've tried it on a few patients. I haven't seen um, amazing results, I'm not going to lie, um, and, I've, and I've kind of backed away from it. I think obviously the, the effects of PRP are undoubted, undoubtedly fantastic for skin rejuvenation. We're moving more towards PRF in the UK. I don't know what you guys' experiences out there uh, is, but we're moving more towards um, uh, PRF and we're kind of taking um, the way we're even centrifuging them is different. We're going for more horizontal centrifuging and trying to really, really um, get that kind of uh, smaller quant quality um, um, solution to inject. And it normally tends to be about one or two mils of PRF and we can see good results with that. But for PRP specifically from asthma, in all honesty, I, I'm still um, slightly hesitant. Lasers, obviously you guys have mentioned, you've got the wealth of knowledge and experience. Some of the previous panel members have um, done this you know, longer than I've been a doctor. It's incredible. Um, Q-switch lasers, ND-YAG, Pikachu, Nanashore, Erbium Fractional. There's so many different options, combinations of options. Um, and I think it is down to patient selection and making sure that we do the right thing for the right patient at the right time. And I think a lot of that comes down to the consultation, making sure that we have a really thorough, deep, in-depth conversation with that patient and setting their expectations appropriately and knowing that this is going to be a long road and I think that's where a lot of the more junior practitioners may actually fall down and there may be slight hurdles in their practices because they sometimes we can overpromise what we can deliver and I think we should always um, under 
promise and over deliver. I think that's the best way that we get the best results and actually we get happy patients that then go and refer and give us our busy clinics. Um, IPL treatments we do in the clinic for melasma. I just picked up on a, a meta-analysis. So you guys want to reference, you're more than welcome. Just put, ping me a message, I can show you. Um, there's a meta-analysis of uh, eight studies, 215 patients in total, where their Massey score um, was seen with IPL treatments. And of course we know it works really, really well. And um, you know the P score is is so so low. It's fantastic results across the board, and it shows there is a high level of efficacy. And um, in in the UK, however, we are kind of slightly more. I think with with the way that our uh, risk based approaches in the UK, we are slightly more risk adverse, and we kind of. Most of the companies will he be hesitant to treat a type four um, with IPL, and we, you know, we kind of like our insurances get a bit iffy about it. Um, so we probably don't have as much experience dealing with darker skin types with IPL as you guys do. I think it's um, really fantastic for us to learn from different international uh, perspectives. Uh, high satisfaction, but obviously potential um, uh, adverse events uh, that can occur with uh, IPL as long as, oh, like, like the previous moderator mentioned, not just IPL, but lots of different treatments can give longer term, even the Q-switched um, lasers can give longer term uh, unpredictable results. And sometimes we can um, fail to see that in the short term and sometimes they come they come up and bite us in the bum afterwards. TCA peels we're using quite a lot in the clinic and it's sometimes not my first line but um, this is a patient with almost like a poikiloderma type pigmentation and hypopigmentation patches we were seeing um, but she had biopsy uh, performed uh, and you know the, the, she's tried everything um, in the NHS and really couldn't find very much that was going to help but we've then eventually done a course of TCA peels and then radiofrequency assisted microneedling um, which has really, really been a big part of the way that I'm treating patients now in my clinic. Um, and I know radio frequency normally isn't associated. Sorry, radio, yeah, radio frequency normally isn't associated with massive effects on um, on uh, pigmentation. But in, in my clinic, as you can see here, this is one example. But we can see a lot of the patients that are coming in for skin rejuvenation treatments. We are picking up that their pigmentation is also improving in the background which is fantastic. And we can see that uh, in the longer term, it just means that they're more likely to be uh, compliant with their, with their skincare. And also because they can see these kind of results, we can see improvement in collagen synthesis. We can see tightening and brightening reduction in pore size. So that's down to the microneedling, but uh, the peels themselves, in my opinion, did probably little for her pigment. And I think a lot of that was down to the actual radio frequent, radio frequency assisted microneedling. Um, I don't know what if, uh, different devices you may have with regards to this. We use the Morpheus H. Where the Morpheus H should hopefully be available with you guys in, in India. If it isn't really, it should be soon. Um, but it's one of the best that we found that um, we can really, really target. So this guy's come in just for pigmentation treatment. So we're using um, the uh, Morpheus Oak as a microneedling and then it's firing in this radio frequency energy. I use it alongside a cooling device just because it can become quite painful. And so we're tending to using a cooling device, cooling the temperature down of the skin to about minus 25, minus 30 before we're hitting it with the needles um, because it can be quite a painful experience. Um, and then finally, we always talked about procedural elements such as glycolic peels. And this is a patient we just used topical um, glutathione patient. We're not talking about melasma specifically now, we're talking generally about pigmentation. So this is obviously a course of glycolic peels with some topical glutathione. We can see there's been um, really nice improvement, improvement in the pore size and, and obviously background uh, collagenesis has been fantastic, neocollagenesis, um, but also uh, it's managed to change her hair color as well. Uh, but we have also see there's just this beautiful skin tone and the shine that comes through. We can see that with a lot of different peels, but glycolic um, peels definitely. And uh, like your experience in uh, in India, we we use we tend to use kind of um, sometimes 50, sometimes 70 percent glycolics, and we slowly build up as time goes, and we see that there's normally a really really good response and a lot of good compliance uh, for these patients. Um, that's all I have, just because it was a very short session. But thank you, and I've opened up to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Shreel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raj. And um, I'm just checking. I think there were two questions that came in. Um, let me just see if I can take them for you right now. I think actually it's more or less the same. Oral, uh, uh, can you go to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen? I'll see, you'll see a Q&A box out there and just see the last two questions over there. 
dose and dilution of injectable transdynamic acid in melasma. So we, we, we tend to use the 100 milligram per mil, and I kind of hyper dilute it just because we, we know we don't want to cause any potential localized issues. And um, so I tend to dilute it in uh, normally five mils to 10 mils of uh, bacteriostatic saline and then still use it relatively sparingly in micro, micro kind of um, aliquots. And we share that across the whole area. I don't know whether anyone else's experience is, is different to that. It's, on the panel? No? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, an oral tranexamic acid would we, we tend, um, yes, yes, you've turned your camera Dr. Abrathim Dr. Abrathim, you need to unmute. Sorry. Hi, Dr. Raj. Uh, we use one is to two dilution, usually. I use that in my practice. Do you use uh, formula? Uh, one, and, one is to two dilution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, fair. that's fair. That's fair. I think that's, that's very fair. For oral tranexamic acid, I'd, I'd re, I think you can use about 250 milligram BD, but were you guys using something similar? Or? We actually, there was a study in Nepal in 5,000 women which said 250 OD. OD. So yeah. I have lessened my dosage to 250 OD now. We were also doing 500 OD or 250 BD, but <laughs> I've kind of half the dose and and you and that's what we did to be honest the lady who i gave it to we we did reduce it down to od for her um the one i used in the in the um in the presentation and we we see great results with with even just 250 milligrams once a day yes yes and yes needless needless risk to double the dose and and if you can already see therapeutic value true okay great so i think that brings us to the end of for this session and our day. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raj, for this detailed and intriguing session. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aftatim, for coming in back to uh, support uh, Dr. Raj on that. Thank you so much. So uh, this brings us to the end of today's webinar on management of melasma and hyperpigmentation. Uh, we've had a perfect mix of uh, an India and global perspective all through our five sessions that we've had today. The webinar was organized by Aesthetic Medicine India and powered by IPCA. I would like to thank all our panelists for being a part of this webinar and sharing such great insights. It was indeed a pleasure hearing each and every one of you. Our partner, Ipka, thank you for all the support. I would also like to thank you, our attendees, for your support and presence at the webinar today and all those active questions that came coming in through. Uh, kudos to our dedicated team for putting this event together. And as we come to the end of this evening, we are looking forward to positive and safe times ahead for all of us. Thank you once again and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.